delve. One, abduction. My name is Irvin Costigan. I am, due to circumstances I will explain, being held captive in a city beneath the earth, somewhere in the wilderness west of the mountains. I will endeavor to record how I came here as best I can these next few days. Soon, I will make an attempt at escape, one I am almost certain will fail. But whether or not I see the light of the sun again, I mean to leave this hidden in the upper caverns as a warning to those men who might stumble into the dark in the future. I came here not knowing the risks that dwelt below. Let it not be said that I did not do everything in my power to ward off others from the same awful end. I am a son of Virginia. I was born to a well-off family of craftspeople near Richmond. My father a master gunsmith and upscale metalworker, intended that I should go to school up the coast, or perhaps even in Europe. But much as I enjoyed the works of great naturalists and daydreamed about strange landscapes out west, strict schoolroom endeavors never took hold with me, and I was drawn to rougher and wilder work. A boyhood friend of mine, Hagen Longstreet, had spent a winter as a long hunter under the tutelage of his elder cousin, Ants, and having done quite well for themselves off the back of hunting bison, elk, and deer in the untamed land beyond the mountains, they needed another hand for their coming trip. So it was that, in the October of 1769, I set out with Hagen from Richmond toting guns and trailing dogs on horseback, to the protests of my mother who chased us down the lane as we went. There is more to be said, of course, about troubles at home and the drama involved in my departure, but it has been years, and too much has happened for me to dwell on it. Suffice it to say, I did not leave on the best of terms, and because of the danger inherent in the profession I'd chosen to pursue, I imagine my family back home assumes I've been killed west of Appalachia, whether by the elements or by Indians. Would that it had been so simple. Ants had gone ahead of us to stake out an autumn camp in the rugged Kentucky Territory, so it was just Hagen and I on the road those first few weeks. I had dreamed for years of the freedom, risk, and excitement offered by the frontier so often discussed by travelers back home but the sheer titan openness of the land didn't strike me until we were in the Appalachian Range. We crossed through the Cumberland Gap late in the month and emerged into the lower hill country in early November as the nights grew damp and cold. Other than two scattered crews of lean summer fur traders headed back east, a pair of Shawnee hunters who stopped to speak with Hagen in their own tongue along the road, and a single band of shifty-looking men we took to be prospective squatters who we overtook later down the route. We passed to no one on the trail during all that time. Since the signs of town and farm died at the foot of the mountains, I felt as if we'd come into an abandoned and silent land. But it wasn't silent, not entirely. Black bear and elk crashed through the trees of lonely valleys at our passing, and the fiery autumn leaves of the Blue Ridge and Outer Mountains rustled with the lilting song of birds moving southward. We spied a mountain lion in the lower hills once, interrupting her as she dragged a deer along a rocky creek bed we'd come to cross in the yawning wilderland. She bolted for the trees at the barking of our dogs, but waited only long enough to be sure we were on our way before creeping back into the red light of the coming dusk to finish her work. 
Above the shadows of prowling animals, the gurgling of streams, and the sweep of chill winds, we watched for the Indians who rule that country, and often glimpsed them as distant silhouettes, watching our passing from rocky ridges in the scant light of dawn. But close as we held our rifles, neither wildlife nor savages troubled us, and we made our quiet way into the low country without violence. Hagen told me this was regular. The Shawnee and Cherokee and others of their ilk were by now, he said, either too scared or too rich off the proceeds of trade to trouble with us. It was conflict over the buffalo herds of the lower plains and rolling hills of western Kentucky that posed a risk. Thus, as the forest became less dense and the titan chestnuts gave way to equally ancient oaks in the low country, we ceased to burn fires in the cool night and kept the hunting dogs close and quiet on the road. This only exhilarated me further, the strangeness of my breathtaking surroundings combining with the unspoken danger of the expanse and unseen threats beyond the hills to fill my heart with an excitement it had never known in the safety of bustling towns and walled settlements. I'd been so desperate for the freedom and exhilaration promised by the land west of the mountains that I'd told my parents I didn't care whether I returned or not. If I took an arrow to the throat my first day past the Cumberland Gap, then I'd have lived more in those scant hours than I'd ever have lived in decades spent toiling beneath a roof back home. This flirtation with danger only confirmed my boasts. I was alive out here, finally able to witness firsthand the flora and fauna I'd only read about in the books of naturalists. I was free, and damn the consequences. Perhaps, if Indians and wild country were all I had to worry over, I would still feel that way. Tensions grew as we went further and further west. Hagen would steer us so we'd hit little slipshod cabins and nascent farmsteads in the open country, where the poorest and most adventurous of the men back east had begun to stake their claims before their betters bought up the land privately. Most of these families he knew in passing from his prior excursion, and he asked after ants with them. Apparently, ants had been tasked with sending word of an exact location back to us via these scattered frontiersmen, and yet even as November grew long and a colder December loomed large, he had sent no instructions back for us. Hagen's mood grew dark and, at length, as we entered the southwestern span of the Kentucky Territory, he began to share vague yet eerie details about the region we were headed for, which had troubled him since discovering the spot the previous winter. Despite the fact that buffalo had become rare in the western reaches of Kentucky Territory due to hunting by white traders and enterprising Indians looking to sell to isolated frontier forts, squatters in the mountains, and the cities back along the eastern coast. None of these hunters had quite cracked the spot Hagen and Ants had found yet. The valley we were headed for, an isolated lowland between two hilly, forested ridges that dwarfed the softly rolling hills and meadows of the surrounding country, was home to two large herds of the prized beasts, and a number of deer and smaller quarry besides. A band of Chickasaw seasonally camped and hunted nearby the spot, and because Hagen and Ants said they were enemies to the Shawnee, they'd done some trade and talking with the cousins the year prior. Once they'd learned the cousins had found the Misty Valley and meant to return the next season to hunt it in earnest, the Chickasaw had warned Ants, who'd learned a good deal of their speech, not to hunt or camp in the valley. They had said it was a trap, and that no man should walk in the shadows there, but became a cagey when pressed for details on the matter. Moreover, though Ants had always brushed the warning off, Hagen remembered feeling uneasy there during their short scouting mission in. As we moved further and further west without hearing from Ants, Hagen's worries only grew and though I had the feeling he didn't want to scare me needlessly by venting all of his worries to me, he shared enough that I grew wary of the place before ever I saw it. 
When we came into Chickasaw country proper, we were met by a group of four men who, though Hagen knew scant little Chickasaw speech and they knew little English, seemed to indicate they recognized Hagen and had seen ants. But the quartet of red men seemed uncertain about ants, glancing to one another and trying to conjure up words they did not know. When at length we turned for the valley, they tried in vain to wave us off. The language barrier did not allow them to tell us why, but as the afternoon drew on and we came into the shadow of the hills that marked the border of the vale, I found myself uncertain and truly frightened for the first time on our trip. We decided we would camp outside the valley on the grassland that first night, since sundown was already upon us. We would only cross in to find ants and whatever camp he'd set up in the light of dawn. But as Hagen shrouded our tethered horses and dogs with scrub he cut from the meadow to shield them from any unfriendly eyes, and the silent December night closed in about us without any hint of bug or bird song, my companion did not prepare for sleep. Instead, he insisted we take turns at watch. I asked if he suspected some trickery on the part of the Chickasaw, but this he denied. Rather, it was the slopes leading up to the valley we planned to hunt that Hagen kept his eye on as I wound down for rest. Once dark had truly fallen, and the winter haze of chill mist rose up off the myriad ponds and streams that broke the softly rolling hills, he finally told me what had been troubling him. He told me of things which had happened the prior year during their visit to the valley. He said his cousin had pulled a strange string of dark legendry from the Chickasaw on their first meeting something about a rival tribe which dwelt in the stone. I've come to think this meant caves, something lost on all of us at the time. The Chickasaw said that many years ago, they had fought a fierce series of wars with this tribe of stone giants, and had eventually collapsed many of their living places, and sealed off their villages. But the valley, they said, was dark enough in the dead of night that the stone giants didn't fear to traverse it and this had prevented the Chickasaw Band from trapping their enemies there. It had become a sort of unhallowed ground to them, and though they had freely admitted the game was plentiful there, they had warned Hagen and Ants off hunting the place just as desperately during the first year's trip as they had this winter. Then, in the silence that fell after, Hagen told me they had spent but one night in the valley last year and that he'd experienced something he'd long dismissed as imagination. He had always been prone to allowing his mind to play tricks on him out here in the open country beyond the Blue Ridge, he said, part of the reason he'd been so eager to have me along with him to tail his cousin, so he wouldn't have to make the long ride alone. Sounds and distant motion itched at a man's mind out here, in all this open and beautifully empty land making him doubt that he was alone even when he knew better. Last winter, during their single stop on the bountiful valley floor after a day spent observing the herds and scattered deer there, Hagen and Ants had made camp along the tree line much as we'd done that night. Ants, never one to waste an opportunity for sleep no matter the discomfort, was quick to bed and slept soundly till dawn. But Hagen was not so fortunate and had awoken perhaps an hour before dawn at what he thought was a subdued sound of fear from one of their horses. Hagen told me he'd sat upright, looking off into the obscuring veil of shadow between the trees where the horses stood still and silent, uncharacteristically frozen for minutes as he watched. He felt fear, but, unlike prior bouts of Wilderland paranoia in lonely places, there was an edge to this fear, an edge that cut to the core of him as he shivered in the damp pre-dawn morning and made him certain he was being watched. Adding to this fear, the horses and the dogs both would lose low and long vocalizations now and then, as if the beasts were desperate to voice their discomfort, but simultaneously petrified to draw more attention to themselves. At some point, 
After what felt like ages laying in uncomfortable silence, debating whether to wake Anne's as his eyes searched for purchase they could not find in the dark, dawn slowly broke somewhere past the treetops and painted the sky a deep, tentative blue. A crashing came from the trees as an unseen form fled for the deeper woods, and at once, Hagen was certain whatever made it had moved on two legs. The horses cried and the dogs yowled, but the usually fierce hounds gave no chase. Ants, awakened by the commotion, asked his cousin what had happened, but shrugged off Hagen's worries when a brief search showed no sign of Indians. During their long and uneventful trip back home, Hagen had convinced himself it had been a deer, or maybe a large wolf, scoping them out before being startled in the dark. He told himself that his own imagination had been to blame. But now, with ants having been quiet for weeks, the uninterpreted warnings of the Chickasaw fresh on our minds, and the dead quiet of the woods around the valley closing in to surround us, he'd begun to wonder once more. I agreed to sit watch for him, and wake him up in a few hours to take his own. The animals, while still, seemed on edge, and when at last Hagen did manage sleep, and I found myself alone, the quiet became agonizing. Once in a while, the wind would shake the bald branches about us, or the distant yipping of coyotes or howling of wolves would roll out to my ears from somewhere amidst the outer dark. But all that murk and mist that choked the dreary land about us was, for the most part, wholly silent. Sometime past midnight, judging by the moon that sometimes peeked down from the overcast sky, I thought I noticed the horses shift and shuffle uneasily across the way. I walked out to them and scanned the clearing nearby, but saw nothing. The trees leading uphill towards the ridge in the eerie valley beyond were so veiled with blackness that nothing could be seen there, and at length, after many tense moments of fruitless listening, I returned to my perch and rode out the rest of my watch in alert and twitchy stillness. I woke Hagen not terribly long afterward for his shift. He took it without complaint, only asking whether I'd seen or heard anything strange. I told him the horses had perked up some time ago, but I'd not caught anything afterward. He nodded, silent and stalwart as ever, and shook off his weariness for his watch. The sun rose without incident. We broke our modest camp and pushed up the steep hills while the frost still made the mud and slopes firm enough to pass unfettered, and came at last to the ridgeline around the hated valley. In the morning light, it was almost heavenly, wreathed in mist so dense it seemed as if we looked down upon clouds from above, with the half-glimpsed glitter of crystal dancing on the cold-kissed grass and scrub beneath. Though they could not be seen, the distant crunch of bison on frosty ground and the nasal vocals of elk came to our ears. With the light of day on us, the occasional chirp or chatter of winter birds was heard. The beauty of that contained vista was almost enough to make us forget the tension of the night which preceded it. But we did not forget. Hagen fired his weapon into the air, and I followed suit, the agreed signal to Ants that we'd found the valley. But there came no reply, and after a brief moment of wary silence, the beasts below the mists went back to their accustomed clamor. We scoured the valley for him, our efforts only picking up as noon neared and the mists cleared. We found traces of several fires along the outskirts of meadows on the valley floor, all of them hugging the banks of a large creek that broke the center. Horse droppings and the spore of hunting dogs helped our own canines stick to a relatively steady trail, but despite our pace and the continued firing of rifles here and there along the way as signal, we heard no beckoning shots in reply and saw no trace beyond prints. In the middle afternoon, Hagen, perhaps stricken with the intuition of a relative, ducked into a dense string of pines along a runoff stream that fed the main creek. It was thick enough that the boughs blotted out most of the sun and ate up any chill wind, 
but the branches were far up enough that the four or five feet of clearance allowed for room to bed down. They were arranged in a circle, and the gap in the center of the trees hosted spent embers which, when turned, still smoked with the heat of a recent fire. It seemed the perfect camp. Shielded from the elements, one was also invisible from the outside the moment they ducked in. Hagen thought the fire must be no more than two nights old, but the camp had been slept in for more than a couple nights. The limbs of several pines had been cut off and piled to make a spongy bed of brush upon the ground, and overhead, a treated hide had been pulled taut as a lean-to tent to fight back the worst of any winter rain. Rough cookware was scattered around the ashes, all of it unclean and collecting moisture from days left to gather the cold morning dew. One of our dogs, rooting around in the blanket of fallen needles near one of the tree trunks, nosed out a lump of flesh which, on closer inspection, turned out to be the ear of one of Anse's hounds. There was also a large, furry patch of skin outside the camp, amidst several great smears of mud and blood perhaps part of the flank of Anse's lone horse. We knew then that something dark had happened here, but Hagen could not so easily give up the search, and I shared the sentiment. And so we rode on, following our dogs in the larger creek. We discovered no more fires and found no more horse tracks, but we did find boot prints about a mile from the pine camp, down low in the mud along the bank as if the wearer had stooped low to drink. We kept our rifles close at hand and primed, and we kept our voices hushed. There was no talk of why, or speculation about possible explanations. We just knew it was better to tread lightly and be ready. But when the sun began to sink, and the shadows grew long, and still no concrete sign of ants had surfaced, Hagen suggested we make haste for the ridge, and camp outside the valley again. He got no argument from me, and we made a speedy retreat over the nearest hills. We pitched camp subtly, as we'd done the night prior, this time even more wary of how visible we might be from afar. After a long and quiet meal of cold meat, I took the first watch again. Though it passed without visible incident, the silence was accompanied once more by the chill certainty that I was not alone with Hagen in the dark out there, and that the uncharacteristically twitchy and demure mood of the dogs was not coincidence. I watched the trees towards the hills this time, ignoring the rolling grassland we'd crossed to find the place. Whatever the Chickasaw feared, whatever had attacked ants, had come from the Vale. Again, Hagen rose to take my watch. Though I noticed he'd slept not a wink in the time allotted to him, he insisted he was fit to do the job, and I turned in. Now, I cannot be certain what happened after this, in the hours before dawn. Despite my nerves, I was exhausted from the long night and the longer journey, and I fell into a deep and weary sleep almost immediately. When I did wake... Everything happened so fast and in such total darkness that I did not grasp what was actually going on. Hagen was the only one who really experienced what was to come, and for reasons that will become evident later, he did not have much time to communicate his experience to me. Still, I will write it out as best I can, in hopes any good men who stumble on this might be able to piece together what happened and where we were taken on that last night I spent beneath the stars. Hagen was, by his account, keenly aware of a similar sensation of being watched before long had passed. He patrolled the perimeter of our area, sticking to the most open parts of brush, and remained alert to any whining among our animals. He stared out into the dark for some time, trying to make out shapes he thought he saw dancing between the tree trunks. Then, all at once, he was stricken senseless by some projectile hurled from the dark, a stone or perhaps a hunk of sodden wood. There was a baying and squealing as the dogs were attacked, 
and one of the horses broke free and bolted screaming into the night while the other fought its binds in vain. In a fumbling daze, he fired his rifle, which he kept primed for the purpose, and the spark of the blind blast he threw into the woods along the slope up towards the valley ridge revealed dozens of pairs of eyes surging forth from the dark. I awoke amidst the clamor, but I have no memory of moving to rise. I seemed already to have been swept up in a great pair of iron-strong hands, with one tied about my throat and one pinning my legs together, carrying me overhead like an ape loping with a trophy. Any blind flailing or prying at long, tapering fingers I did was fruitless, and I was hauled off like a thrashing child through the blackness of the woods, with Hagen coming close behind. The wiry giants which carried us moved too quickly and stuck too deep to the shadow for me to get a good look at them in the chaos, but the pack moved with the silent precision of wild animals through the pitch darkness. I heard the fading shrieks as our animals were slaughtered, bare-handed, I'd guess, based on what I'd later see of the cave things. Before long, we were perhaps a mile off, over the ridge and into the Forbidden Valley, where the pale giant's bare skin glinted with the moisture of the cold night as they lurched through moonlit meadows and scrambled through brush and branches that bit at my cheeks and limbs in the dark. I didn't have time to dwell on the demoniac insanity of it, those half-glimpsed ghosts from the dark making off with us like wild game. I had less than five minutes, I'd guess, from abduction to our arrival at that awful crack in the earth. As has been the case thus far, I saw little in the dark of the night, and I cannot describe what exactly the entrance to the cave looked like. It was in some of the densest woodland in the valley, and was so small only one of the giants could shimmy through at a time, with Hagen and I being dragged in after them by the legs like two captured winter hares, both too breathless and bruised by the brief journey to struggle or yell in the moment. They began their descent, the plummet into the bowels, into hell. Indeed, given the half-seen nature of our abductors and their almost preternatural speed and coordination in the dark, I mused more and more that we were actually being hauled hellward by imps or demons vomited forth from the pit itself. The chill of winter fast abated, and the warmth of inner earth, with which I've become so familiar over time, swept in to embrace us, lending credence to my darkest imaginings. Time clogged in the mind during that long trip down, with hour after sightless hour spent without sensation save for the alien chatter of the things as they clicked and whistled low to one another in the blackness, or the soft shuffle of them as their warband felt its way down familiar chutes and slid with practiced grace between stony jams and clustered stalagmites in the murk. The trickle of water sometimes swelled to a gurgle, and after being dragged through the chill water once or twice as my carrier crouched low to navigate a cramped tunnel blind, I came to realize we were following a stream as it wound its way ever downward into the deeps of the stone. Occasionally we would come into a large chamber, and the clacking vocalizations of the hunters that carried us would echo like voices in an empty theater. Far more commonly, we would spend sightless ages being dragged in narrow tunnels too small for our captors to pass upright or crouched, our clothing torn to ribbons and our skin gouged and scuffed on unforgiving edges as we were slid unceremoniously across the rocks. We would be lowered down like rag dolls from hand to hand as our captors scurried ape-like down rough shafts in the ground, the slick slides never seeming to slow the giants. Roaring waterfalls sang their songs in great vistas lost to my eyes even as we passed through them, and eerie bug song whispered down passages so tight I had to hold my breath to fit through them as we went making me marvel at the flexibility and agile grace the things that carried us must have. It went on long enough that I grew weak with thirst, and began lapping up water from the stream we trailed like a dog each time the thing's path took me through the chill water. The taste clear as crystal, 
and shot through with a silt of sediment so fine it could hardly be detected. I considered attempting escape in some way, as I'm sure Hagen must have done, but the utterly unnavigable nature of my environment meant that even if I did slip free in sudden struggle, my captors would find me, and perhaps punish me. Small insects often scurried upon my skin, something I felt more and more as the jagged edges of stone tore more and more of my clothing away. I had time to wonder whether I should begin to snatch and eat these as hunger began to gnaw at me. Through it all, so far as I could hear, our captors never slowed and never hesitated. They never ate and they never drank. They never slept and they never paused to reassess the path before them in the all-consuming gloom. By the time, unbeknownst to me, we'd neared the end of the journey, I'd entirely given myself over to the idea that the things were unnatural, and with perhaps more than a day having been spent on the move, I toyed with the idea that this was some hell all its own, that I would be suspended there among unseen monsters in unfriendly surroundings, in torment, forever. But around the moment I began to weigh my mortal sins and moral shortcomings to attempt to determine what had landed me such a punishment, I gradually realized the things which carried us had grown agitated or animated, their strange speech rapid and sudden, as one barked to the other through the dark. There was a rustling and jostling amongst the monsters, and I heard a startled yelp from Hagen up ahead of me, the first noise other than muffled groans or gasps I'd heard from him in all this time. I struggled then, expecting the worst, my beastly instinct to survive overpowering any logical realization there could be no escape in my circumstances. But I was not stricken or slain. I was merely dropped casually into a slick-sided, sloped tunnel, I slid down without time to do more than kick and flail at slippery walls which gave me little purchase. I sprawled on damp stone when I at last came to a halt, and found I had bumped up against Hagen in the dark. Ours were the only sounds I heard in that moment, and I reached out and found his shoulder in the blackness. He told me in a whisper so soft I strained to hear it to open my eyes and only then realizing they were casually shut against the strain of so long spent looking for light where there was none, I obeyed. We crouched then in a big room of mossy stone, shot through with hanging stalactites and rising stalagmites that made the room feel like a great green predator's mouth. The giants had not followed us down. We both struggled to stand on the moss of the chamber, for it shifted like damp leaves over mud beneath our worn boots. There was a flickering, ambient glow by which we saw, a candle burning upon the bare floor across the room, I realized, and I had to catch my breath when I registered sluggish and cautious movement stirring around it. Hagen was faster than I, reorienting himself. The pain of even so minor a light after so very long spent blind had left my head spinning, I don't know how Hagen determined the vague figures around the candle's glare were not yet more of our captors so quickly, but he did so, and cried the name of his cousin, leading me to follow him over and lean, eyes shielded, over the glare of the candle. Ants looked even worse than Hagen and I must have looked. His scalp was split in several places, and his face was streaked with long dried blood. His body... Nude save a makeshift wrap of dirtied cloth, was blue with bruised flesh as often as it was pale with the terror of the moment. His teeth were half missing, and one of his eyes was still swollen shut. He lay despondent amongst several other equally disheveled men, all of these strangers to me, red Indians of one tribe or another, the entire group looking as if all traces of hope had departed them. But Hagen's voice stirred him, and after a groggy moment spent confirming this was no dream, Ants told us in tones made ragged by strife the story of how he'd come to be there. He'd lasted far longer in the valley than we had, several weeks in fact, 
but eventually the stirrings of things unseen in still forests alerted him to watchers in the night. An early snow had fallen perhaps six days prior to our arrival, and in the stark white of the blanketed valley he had found bare footprints he deemed too large to be a man's, and had spotted lean silhouettes ducking back behind trees near dusk, their frames outlined plainly against the blaring gleam of the frozen woodland. Even amidst all the strangeness, Ants had apparently convinced himself for the first few nights it was just rival hunters looking to scare him off a good piece of land. But eventually, the cave things had grown bold and had begun calling to one another around the camp through the night, sometimes mimicking his frustrated shouts into the dark. At first, he built fires to keep them at bay, for the things balked at bright light. But eventually, this had ceased to work and their glimmering eyes betrayed them as no ordinary men. Ants had made a break for the outside just a handful of days prior, but they had taken him during his flight in the half-light of late dawn. Hagen recounted our story in turn, allowing me to hear his half of our abduction for the first time. We three figured that Hagen and I had been snatched perhaps only three nights after Ants. But in those intervening days... Ants had learned much, and he began to babble it out like a madman desperate for an audience. Indeed, had our circumstances not themselves been so insane, I would have struggled to believe him. But Ants was never an imaginative man, and his eyes spoke nothing of madness, only of fear. He told us in hushed but frantic tones that the things that had brought us here were looking for information of some kind. They had cities and territories down here, he said, and the group which had captured us was some kind of raiding party, sent forth by one of these undercities many days traveled to the west. They sought information about the eastern mountains, Appalachia, Ants speculated, and a once-allied series of cities beneath it, with which they were now at war. These eastern cities of cave things had fallen into strange habits of worship, at least by the standards of the cave things, and the war which had recently broken out was blamed primarily on this religious conversion. All these concepts of underground cities and subterranean geographies were alien to me then, but if I held any doubt to how true it all was, time would strip those doubts from me. But in the moment, I must have been dumbstruck, Speechless while ants babbled of things for which my blessedly sheltered mind had no frame of reference. Our abductors were in doubt over whether the surface folk, as they called us, had also fallen into these strange ways of worship, and had been snatching as many human beings from beneath the stars as they could in order to determine whether we too were tainted, as they put it. They would interrogate the two of us soon, he guessed. Ants urged us to play along and to do as we were asked, for dissent and resistance were not tolerated among the pale giants. But as his desperate tirade came to a gradual end, Ants trailed off and locked eyes with me in the dark. An even keener pallor came over him then. He asked Hagen whether he'd taught me any Indian tongues on the way out here, and seemed doubly shaken when Hagen answered that he hadn't. Ants shook his head, muttering to himself, more indistinct sounds of hopeless woe than any distinct words. Eventually he spoke. The Indians we'd found with ants were apparently from varied bands spread across the banks of the Ohio and the western reaches of Appalachia, but all of them spoke dialects of either the Cherokee, Shawnee, or Chickasaw languages. These were the languages with which the cave things were familiar. Ants went on to say that two French trappers from west of the river had been brought in the same day as him, and both had been brained with stone clubs the moment it was revealed they knew nothing but French, and had not been through Appalachia to arrive in the region. Not long before we arrived, several southbound Iroquois traders snatched from where they'd camped alongside their canoes on the banks of the Ohio had met a similar fate. Even though I had come through Appalachia, 
and even though I had Ants and Hagen to translate for me, Ants doubted the brutal creatures would see the value in keeping me alive. They valued human beings but little, and whatever information they were looking to pull from us, they seemed not to trust it to the vagaries of translation. We all stood there in silence for a long, long time, milling about the room and basking in the dire nature of our situation. Perhaps an hour was spent like that, in the timeless depths of a sunless world which knows no time. But whether it was an hour or ten minutes spent pacing and waiting for execution and listening in vain for the sounds of our captor's eventual approach, it felt far longer than either. When salvation came, it came unexpectedly, from one of the Red Men, who stood up and revealed himself to be a Cherokee from the Carolina Highlands, with some command of the English language. He suggested my situation wasn't hopeless. The chutes the cave things used were too slick for surface men to crawl back up them once at the bottom, so the entrance to our makeshift prison wasn't an option. But there was a chute along the far wall of the chamber in which we stood, hidden amidst a forest of low stalagmite fangs thrust up from the floor, directly across from the one we'd been slid down to get here. This opposing chute went straight down into blackness and was used as a sort of trash dump by our captors, who threw food scraps and the corpses of men they killed down it when they'd finished with them. There was a deep body of water down there, the Cherokee knew, for whenever the cave things used the trash chute, the echo of impacted water and its splashing aftermath rang back up the passage to him. Hagen protested, insisting we couldn't know how far the drop was from here and how deep the water was. Moreover, there was no way to know whether there would be a navigable exit or whether I'd be able to find my way out in the dark. But the Cherokee countered that any chance of survival, however slim, was better than none to those with something to live for, and Ants nodded solemn agreement. I weighed my options, but I didn't linger. Our captures were, Ants said, likely supping and sleeping briefly above us, and would be down to see to their two new prizes before long. As I saw it, to stay was to agree to a certain execution, and as much terror as the prospect of delving alone into the unknown below dredged up in me, the same foolhardy, pugnacious desire for challenge and adventure demanded I try to last as long as I could and do everything in my power to see the sun again. Perhaps, had I known what awaited me, I would not have gone. I might have made peace with my creator and awaited whatever was in store for me, a quick death rather than a lingering nightmare. But even now, riding with all the awful experience I've accrued, I cannot blame myself for risking the jump into the unknown. I did what I felt I had to do. I told my friends in no uncertain terms that I was going, and Ants and Hagen said their goodbyes, and assured me they'd say they hadn't seen me jump, and knew nothing of my whereabouts. Hagen gave me his mostly intact boots, as I'd lost one of mine on the way down, and the other was sorely torn. He also gave me a small morsel of jerky and a brick of pemmican, being assured by his cousin that our captors would eventually feed them, and that I needed the food more than they. Ants gave me a battered but durable hide jacket he'd worn on the night of his capture, telling me it would prove useful against the jagged edges and keen tips of unforgiving stone down there. The spare powder horn Ants carried was still hidden in its sheath within the garment, and when I made to return it, he told me it might serve me better than him. Finally, one of the Indians who spoke no English and whose nation and name I did not learn, gave me two of the small candles the group had been allowed by the cave things, along with a flint shard and the broken end of a rusting knife for use as a striker, with which to light these candles, or perhaps some larger fire, lower in the caverns. Those final tokens were the most vital, and to this day it disturbs me that I will never know the title, or even the country, of the man who gave them to me. I wrapped all these precious things, along with my filthy trousers and stockings, 
in Anse's jacket, hoping the water-resistant material would help act as a float for the things until I got my bearings in the blackness, and perhaps keep them from being soaked through into the bargain. I shook hands with Anse and Hagen, looked longingly at the sputtering pinprick of light by which we'd been blessed with sight after so long in the dark, and then approached the trash chute, trying to steel myself to leave it all behind. It was oval in shape, and for the most part had sides as smooth as the one down which we'd entered the prison. It was significantly wider than a man, and though I knew it must remain wide enough to allow its contents to crash into the unseen water below, I had time on the edge to pray that the sides didn't narrow on the way down, and that the fall would be clean. I lingered, listening to the distant and barely perceptible drip of water somewhere deep down there in the bowels of the earth. Then I jumped. Two. The Lake Chamber I fell for longer than I had expected, the humid and stifling air of the underworld buffeting around my ears as I plummeted. But I soon left the chute free of injury from the walls, and for a few long seconds I felt as if I were in the open sky as sound and space seemed to radiate out around me, and left me with the impression I was in a massive chamber. Then I hit the water, feet first, and despite the shock of entry, the landing was clean, and I found my legs were still in working order as I flailed blindly around for the bundled jacket, which I'd lost my grip on in the moment before impact. The water was shockingly warm, as so much of the underworld has proven to be. But almost nude, I didn't have any clothing to encumber me, and found that my impact was the sole source of ripples along the surface. The pool was remarkably still, but the noises I made carried far and wide, and left me with the impression that I was in a vast body of water. My cautious kicking to stay afloat brushed no stone or obstacles, and I sensed somewhere deep in me that I was far from the bottom. One of my tentative sweeps with my hand over the nearby surface found the bundled jacket bobbing in the water, and I clutched it against one side of me, my last lonely pieces of the world far above. I looked around, and at first took myself to be in total darkness. I looked up and thought I might be glimpsing the faint glimmer of the prison's distant candlelight through the chute I'd jumped down. But then, faint as could be, I realized there was more than one glimmer of light on the ceiling up there, far overhead. There were hundreds of them, spaced across a chamber that must have been more than a mile across. If you've found this account... It's likely you've seen such buried grandeur yourself down here. I would come to learn such things are far more regular than I'd ever dreamed. It took me some moments to adjust my eyes and attain enough calm to really drink in the details of my surroundings, but I soon realized these spots along the cavern's roof moved, shimmering and shifting faintly overhead. It took me yet more nervous moments treading water in the great pool to see their source and recognize that they were coming up from beneath me. I had not bothered as yet to look downward. Partly this was because I had no expectation I would see anything, but this lack of perception had as much to do with the fact that I didn't want to know what was beneath me as it did with my anticipation of total darkness. 
But now I had to look, and what I found was not total darkness. Far below were the faint and wavering outlines of glinting clusters along the lake bottom. And indeed, it must have been a deep subterranean lake, for the gleaming lights on its floor were so far away they looked more like stars than defined shapes. They were vivid and saturated, ranging from blue to pink to yellow, their brightness often wavering from moment to moment. My later experiences would tell me these were almost certainly fungal blooms or some other such luminescent growth, but in the moment, the warbling of the water and the strain of my eyes in the gloom gave them the illusion of movement, and I believed they must be fish or other beasts flitting around down there in the dark. I stared entranced for a short while, but before long, actual movement drew my eyes, this time of a black shape against those distant lake-bottom stars that blotted some of them out as it swam fluidly around in the depths. A shape was all it was to me from so far away. And yet, I knew looking at it, given the distance, the swimmer in the deeps below must be massive indeed. I had never seen a whale or a shark, but it struck me that, knowing as little as I knew about the deep places of the earth, there might be similar things down here, things made strange by lives lived without glimpsing the sun. A chill terror came over me despite the warmth of the water, and I went back to scanning the all but invisible waterline around me, praying I would detect a shore for which I could make a desperate swim. My eyes had continued to adjust to the deepened shadow after being in the comparatively blinding presence of that candle in the prison. More and more fine detail came to me, vague as it was. There were crusts of reflective crystal in the rough, far-off walls here and there, perhaps quartz or some other hazy stone, which caught the stray glows amplified by the water now and then. Subtle as these patterns and reflections were, they looked almost like clouds on a blackened sky, and helped me to trace the outlines of the murky cavern. Spires of stone hung down like spears from the roof in places, and in others it seemed smooth and glassy, and played host much more gracefully to the lights down below. A waterfall, or perhaps more than one, murmured almost unheard against some distant wall as it fed the pool below, and the mist from these unglimpsed impacts shrouded the air in a fine mist. Bats thrummed in small waves overhead, more audible than visible, and snatched bugs from the humid air. Flies or mosquitoes, or something which buzzed like them, skirted past along the surface now and then, and occasionally a splash was heard as a bat swooped low like a seabird and plucked something from the air against the water. Tiny fish about the length of my fingers darted through the lake's higher reaches just beneath me in vast schools, their small bodies occasionally pulsing with a low violet glow, halting now and then to feed on the droppings which the bats loosed from their colonies in the stalactites far above. Darker, Larger forms skulked amidst them, almost my size, zipping up to swallow some of their smaller compatriots now and then when they grew too still. All this I drank in over another minute spent dreading the unseen and continuing my lazy kicks to stay afloat, painfully aware of how awkward my swimming must seem to the life which teemed and hunted and hid all around me. But all at once... As a harsh and horizontal outline not terribly far off, I saw a break in one of the low-set clouds of quartz along the wall nearest me, and the more I looked at it, the more I took that flat line against the low glow of the quartz to be unnatural, a structure of some kind, symmetrical and boxy against the jagged and curving shapes of natural and water-worn stone. Had I not been in so dire a situation, the sight of a hand-shaped structure down there in the dark would have frightened me more than it relieved me. But I didn't have the forethought to think that any hand-shaped structure down there in the depths must, 
by necessity, have been built by the hands of whatever awful cave giants had taken me to begin with. And so, riding myself and securing the bundle of desperately needed supplies, I paddled for that unnatural shape, uncertain of what sort of shoreline it might stand on, but desperate to be back on dry land again. Even if the caves were themselves weird and foreign ground, the lake and its half-seen denizens were even more repulsive. I sided with speed now. I was tentative at first, but figured that the crash of my initial entry into the water had already alerted anything in the area, and that I would be best served by moving quickly, even if that speed was childish and stunted by comparison to the water's native suns. As I moved, I fancied I heard the faint rippling of motion along the surface behind me, but much as I tried to glance back while never slowing my motion, I never saw anything clear, just several outlines hanging back at the edge of my vision, their eyes faintly yellow pinpricks above the disturbed water I left in my wake, following steadily but never drawing near enough to see clearly. That lack of visual confirmation only served to invigorate me and, worried that at any moment some unseen hand or unseen jaw would grip my leg, I put every ounce of starved energy I had into my shoreward swim for relative safety. As I drew nearer to that shore, I realized I had indeed glimpsed the roof of some sort of building. It was one among many seemingly all carven in the stone of the walls and floor, and clustered together on the banks like some strange mirror of a fishing village on the surface. This tiny cluster of buildings projected outward from the wall of the cavern, and the shelf of perfectly flat stone from which it rose was only perhaps ten or twelve feet thick. The lake's surface was almost perfectly even with this shelf, and beneath that surface... The stone arced away to meet the far wall, leaving the clear waters of the pool shadowed and murky beneath. Several docks of unmarked, smooth stone projected out towards me from the main cluster, and they were low enough for me to tug myself up out of the drink. With salvation in sight, I kicked harder than ever I have in my life. My pursuers, perhaps sensing that I was about to escape them, seemed to close in behind me. I heard the distinct disruption of water as one of them sank under, and I swear to this day I felt the rush of something as it made a lunge through the murk towards me. But I hit the side of the dock and jerked myself up and out of the pool with a ferocity only death can drive one to, and with the bundle sprawled out before me, I scurried on all fours like a rat away from the edge and climbed to my feet once more careful not to lose my balance on the slickened stone. I turned and caught sight of the trio which had pursued me. They were about the size of big alligators, but soft and vaguely translucent, with broad heads like a salamander and a swathe of barbels twitching about the needle teeth of their mouths. Their yellowish eyes caught the ambient glow of the chamber as they watched me from below and their frilled spines pulsed with a faint golden light every few seconds, dazzling in the half-light of the lake chamber. The biggest of them, perhaps the one which had lunged for me, seemed to plod forward in the water, its whole body contorting and its paddle-like tail bringing it up to the edge of the dock upon which I stood. It was trying to follow me up, I realized. I doubted its stumpy legs could carry it well if at all, over land. And yet, I wasn't about to stay and gamble on that assumption. I bent to scoop up my bundle, prepared to retreat for the buildings and try to find high ground. But when I rose and began my cautious backpedal away from the water's edge, I saw that my pursuers had all near soundlessly turned tail and began their own rapid retreat from the docks. From the darkness beneath the stone shelf that held the docks and the building, a vast black shape, unseen by me till that moment, pursued the salamander things. Dark as midnight against the gleaming flora far below, 
bloated and round but swift despite its size, and large as a stalwart house back home. I counted my blessings that this half-glimpsed monstrosity seemed to have no legs. The giant pursued the salamander things for only a few short seconds before turning back for the shadows where it dwelt beneath the docks, seemingly oblivious to my presence above. It had only issued forth to run off intruders, I thought. And yet, it must eat well to have attained so awful a size down here in the dark. I stowed these strange speculations away and made for the buildings. The second the threat of water had been put behind me, though, the fear of the pale giants with tapering fingers and iron grasps returned. The harried words ants had offered us in the makeshift prison returned to the forefront of my mind, and I shuddered. What would I do if this was one of their lightless cities, like those ants had mentioned? But there were no traces of growled vocalizations in the shadows amidst all those carven structures, and I saw no flickers of motion save the reflected light upon the quartz cloud up above the buildings. As I pushed out onto the moss-slick streets and gazed into the round apertures that marked what I assumed to be doors or windows, I found no eyes or stirring silhouettes to trouble me, save for a few bats that frightened me half to death flitting from a high balcony as I passed. It seemed more a town than a city, a small outpost with no more than a dozen constructions. The shapes of them were smooth and yet angled, with the edges having often been worn and chipped with age, giving me the impression that it was old indeed. Veiny, pale latticeworks of what I can only describe as a breed of spongy fungal ivy had devoured the walls, and the chutes and walkways that led up into the structures were as slick and unnavigable to me as the trap chute into the prison had been above. Colonies of large insects or crustaceans of some kind, needle-clawed things not unlike lobsters about as long as my hand, dwelt in the long vacant fungal gardens of the structures and preyed upon smaller bugs that hugged the shadows. All this led me to believe that the shoreside town was long abandoned, and the cave things which had once erected it were long gone. There was a broad tunnel looming at the edge of town leading into the wall of the cavern, seemingly carved just like the buildings in the roads, a causeway of sorts, large enough for a dozen men upon horses to pass through abreast but I didn't trouble with that just then. I found an open courtyard near the docks and set up near the center, not too close to any of the looming buildings and not too close to the water's uninviting edge. I hung out Anse's jacket to dry, laid out the damp clothing and candles I'd stowed within it, and took time only to ensure the powder was still secure in its waterproof horn before eating every ounce of pemmican and jerky I'd been given in a voracious frenzy. I had considered rationing it, but as the meager meal sat there cold before me on the unfurled clothing, and the exhaustion and hunger and desperation of the day pressed down upon me, I didn't think at all. I just ate, as if my body demanded it of me. I don't even remember what it tasted like now. Tough and unforgiving, I'm sure, but it has been so very long since I tasted the provender of the surface world that I longed to have some memory of it, even if it were just jerky and dried morsels. But I do not, and I cannot find solace in such memories. I inhaled the food as a man escaped from drowning inhales air, drank deep from the clear water of the pool along the dock, and then curled up on the unforgiving stone and slept for a long, long time, without heeding the unfamiliarity and unspoken danger of the alien world around me. I awoke several times, always from dreams of home, and my exhaustion must have been great indeed, for I was able to slip effortlessly back into slumber each and every time. I was drunk with sleep and bent with hunger again when I finally awoke for good. Long reliance on sensations rather than stars and skies to tell me the time suggests to me now, in reflection, that I slept for a full day. 
I rose and drank my fill from the lake, and once dressed in my filthy but nearly dry trousers and jacket, I slipped on Hagen's gifted boots, thanking creation that they were not more than a little large on me. I considered lighting one of the candles to more closely explore the abandoned village, but thought better of spending the light just then, and used only the ambient gleams that haunted the cavern to navigate. It was during this period of cautious exploration that I found an open porch at the rear of one of the buildings, slightly raised from the village shelf, and overhung with a roof of the pale fungal ivy, which twitched and rippled sluggishly like hair in a calm wind whenever anything moved nearby. This rear exit to the structure also hosted a chute I could not investigate, but there were three skeletons on the stone ground before that chute, all too large to belong to any average man from the surface. The canines of their skulls were elongated slightly, and the sockets were grotesque and wide. The long-fingered hands looked almost delicate with their flesh stripped from them, and nearby lurked the fallen weapons I imagined they had held in their final moments, knives of obsidian and clubs of heavy, solid stone. One of the skulls was hoven in, and another of the corpses had had the bones of its forearms snapped. The moist air of the lake chamber had seen to it that no trace of clothing or soft tissue remained, all having long ago fallen to sludge and dust, or the predations of the insects that scuttled the floor. I understood none of the implications of this then, but merely considered it a stroke of luck. I took the two largest femurs as makeshift clubs, and stowed one of the broad knives near my sleeping space, planning to try and find something to wrap it with for a handle. The stone clubs I left, for I could lift them, but only with effort, and I imagined I would struggle to swing one ably, even if I were better fed and rested. Armed, I felt a little more secure. Crude as the armaments were, the long hours had given me no comfort here in my new environment and amidst all that uncertain darkness, I yearned for the small consolation that I was still capable of violent defense. I lingered in the town for perhaps five days after that. I tried lurking by the water along the docks to snatch fish by hand, but was unsuccessful, and, moreover, feared that I would eventually draw attention from below. So his hunger bit deep, I eventually settled on the colonies of crawling things in the abandoned gardens. They were, as I've said, vaguely lobster-like, though they were far thinner, frilled and spined along the back carapace, and boasted many more legs. I clubbed them with the femurs and broke them open like shellfish, eating their tails raw. They had the earthen taste of dirt about them, but I did not fall ill eating them and was able to gorge myself uncertain of how frequently such easy food would be available to me when I eventually left. Leaving was becoming more and more necessary. I had been untroubled the first couple days, but I had begun hearing stirrings and rustlings in the larger buildings when I'd awakened from sleep, and had twice glimpsed the long, slender legs of some great crawling thing retracting into the chutes along the sides of the dwellings as I strode into view. Though I had not seen this shy giant insect in the open, and had no reason to assume it had taken an interest in me, I didn't want to sit still in the courtyard I occupied long enough to find out firsthand whether it was a predator. But leaving was a challenge all its own. The causeway tunnel which led into the cavern wall and out of town was yawning and black and the low ambient light of the cavern I dwelt in did not reach more than a few dozen yards in before it gave way to total darkness. This demanded I light and spend one of my precious candles for the purpose of navigating, and so, before departure, I needed to ensure I would have a way to make light and keep fire along my trip, whatever my destination. I had spotted strange black-domed mushrooms that the lobster things ignored in their derelict garden burrows, and along with this avoidance, their dry, dusty texture and their foul odor of rot told me they were likely poisonous. 
poisonous or not, they caught fire like decade-dead kindling from the dried flint and broken knife I'd been given, and the bowl shape of the mushroom's cap allowed one to hold it in hand as the embers smoldered amidst its dry gills. I burned several small fires with them, using the pale fungal ivy as smoky fuel in the courtyard during my last day there, a proof of concept in the hopes I could replicate the blaze elsewhere in this titanic hell I'd found myself in. I cooked some of the lobster things, and though this did nothing to help their flavor, it made them decidedly less chewy. I burned several to crust them over as road rations after waking on my final day in the ruined village, and wrapped them in the jacket like a bag, along with many of the dry black mushroom caps and my other supplies. I thought about trying to transition the powder out of the horn and use that as a water vessel, but given all I'd seen of the caverns thus far, water was never far away, and was usually relatively clear. I drank deep, though, just in case. I gathered my courage, lit a candle with the embers of one of my fires, and scooped some of those embers into one of the dry mushroom caps I'd collected in hopes I'd be able to use them to re-establish a fire down the way. Then, I stepped out of the misty damp of the lake chamber and into the gloom of the causeway, hoping, in vain, that it would whisk me away to some place less terrible. Three. The Hunter in the Dark When one finds themselves in total blackness, they fall back on their other senses to fill in the gaps. During my capture and dragging to the prison, I had learned something, though I'm sure far from everything, of the keenness of ear and nose ascribed to the blind. But the causeway and what came after were different. There, for the most part, the blackness was also absolute. But my possession of a candle meant that I was never really immersed in the blind stupor of the underworld, and instead stared with half-focused eyes towards my one flickering lifeline in the dark, my motions all slow and calculated not to trouble its dancing flame and my field of vision reaching perhaps ten paces ahead or to either side before the shadow conquered all once more. Even so, this small bubble of vision was troubled by the bobbing of the flame and the shadows it cast, and more than once, I scared myself senseless as the shadows of rubble or hanging stalactites made giant by the gleam rose up before me, only to vanish at the slight twitch of my wrist beneath the light. I walked until my already tired legs ached, and even at the end of what must have been six miles along the tunnel, I had not come to the route's end. I had passed several gaping intersections with other causeway tunnels of equal dimensions, but, fearful of getting lost and feeling no wind or other trace which might lead me to believe these intersecting passages led upward for the surface, I probed ever onward and took no turns. Occasionally, debris obstructed my path. Most of the time, these were stones from the ceiling. Especially in intersections, the roof seemed to have been left artfully natural, and the rock formations which had once decorated the lanes of the cave things had often fallen or been knocked loose over the intervening march of years. But sometimes... These obstructions were remains, not unlike the ones I had found on the porch back in the lakeside village. Like those, these bones were often very visibly marred or injured, and weaponry, ranging from bone-hafted spears to hammers of some sort of copper or bronze, lay within reach. The dust and dry was more total here, and occasionally... A desiccated piece of some shroud or cape was to be found amongst the dead, 
but these were obviously ancient, and their colors and designs were long lost to the ages. The smallest of these bone fields hosted perhaps a dozen individuals, and the largest, several hundred, spread over about a quarter of a mile of causeway. The gold lust of old Mexico clearly thrived among these dead things, for occasionally a great headdress or circlet of precious metal glinted forth like a tiny sun out of the gloom, and though at first I eagerly collected these as potential loot to be pawned on the surface, I quickly realized the weight would slow my passage and naively vowed to recall the location for later visits. I did, however, swap my femurs for a sturdy copper hammer with a long haft of strange material I'd later come to learn was a chitinous leg segment from some great insect. Now and again my candle would flicker low and sputter out at the behest of some unfelt draft of air or unintended flinch on my part and I would have to struggle with my ember-filled cap or my trusty flint in the murk to re-establish my vision. I became good at this with time, and could usually get a flame back on the wick within a minute or two. But these minutes in blackness were long, and any noises I dredged up out of the distance as I struggled seemed doubly menacing in the dark. The noises themselves were many, Usually it was something as simple as stone cracking against stone, perhaps some rock or tile falling loose from the ceiling and clattering upon the cold ground down one of the connecting tunnels. But sometimes the noises were more bone-chilling. Shrieks like those of a frenzied ape in a menagerie, cackling calls like those of fighting coyotes, or almost musical drones so distant they seemed almost ephemeral. Indeed, I sometimes convinced myself these were hallucinatory, certainly a good medicine for worry in all that unwholesome bleakness. And yet, sometimes they were so close they seemed impossible to deny. The slap of what sounded like bare feet upon stone reared up before or behind me now and then, a noise made all the more uncomfortable by the fact that large cracks in the cavern stone of the walls and great holes in the aged pathway left ample room for unseen watchers to hide. These sprinters in the dark, assuming that's what they were, would cross the causeway forty or fifty yards off and then fall still and silent and not be heard again during my passing. I came out of the tunnel causeway into a much wider cavern a few hours into my trek, and at first, as with my fall into the lake chamber, I did not perceive there to be any light save my own. And yet there were light sources to be found, even more dull than the distant fungi on the lake bottom had been. They came from patches of lichen or moss that lined the roadsides now and then as they forked off and wound away from the clean exit to the tunnel I'd just exited, giving off a faint bluish gleam that was drowned by the stark candlelight, unless one looked hard enough. Based on what I would see later in my travels, I judge these crops of luminescent flora were tended as a sort of urban lighting system at one point but had fallen into centuries of seedy neglect. I doused my candle, though I made sure to keep it handy, and allowed my eyes to adjust, standing still in the blackness as I squinted and struggled to see. The suggestion of edges and lines came forth from the haze of the netherworld's long night, and I saw that I was in another yawning space something my ears had already discerned from the painfully obvious echoes my gentle footfalls sent rolling out through the void. But it was no empty cavern, nor was it host to some vast body of water. The chamber was slightly smaller than the lake chamber, and on many raised and lowered tiers carved into the stone, structures not unlike those of the fishing village leered out of the dark at me their vacant windows and rounded door frames like deep black eyes set back in the shadows. Some were carved into the walls of the cavern itself, and others stood in tight ranks along the tiers of the settlement. 
Smooth roads sized identically to the one I'd walked through the causeway tunnel split this urban outpost into sectors, the moss in the ditches alongside them tossing muted glows up onto the ageless walls. Somewhere in the half-seen tangle of buildings, a stream gurgled as it lazily made its way down some channel that bisected the town. This place was as vacant as the fishing village on the lakeshore had been, and yet, like the village, I assumed there were likely many animal residents alive and well within its strange and masterfully carven walls. But I did not hear them, not readily, as had been the case in the lake chamber. Like so much of the causeway tunnel system, the scores of towering, angular buildings seemed stifled and withdrawn, giving me the impression it was even more unsafe to draw attention to oneself here than it had been in the lake chamber. Simultaneously, I could not help but feel like the city knew I had arrived and did not want me there. I held my looted hammer close and resolved not to use my candle so long as it wasn't absolutely necessary. I walked the half-lit roads, paying close heed to each and every shadow, moving slow and cautious each footfall calculated to make as little noise as possible. Tiny things scurried past now and then, pattering like large roaches in the dark. But no giant shapes stirred, and no louder noises reached my ears. The echoes and hidden runners from the causeway tunnels still seemed absent here, and yet somehow that absence made me more uncomfortable. I suppose I'd grown used to the former horror, and the creeping silence of the large settlement whose streets I walked represented a newer and untested unknown. But much as I tried to count my blessings, and often as I turned corners or checked looming doorways to find the streets and chutes of the derelict city empty, I could not shake the feeling that I was not alone with the carrion scuttlers beneath my feet. I can only speak to what I glimpsed in the low, mossy glow from the roadside loam and mud-caked ditches, but the structures here were more grandiose than their counterparts on the lakeshore. Eerie, angular reliefs of tall, nude figures locked in scenes of struggle with great clawed monsters and many-legged beasts adorned the stone, and they had often been painted and outlined in vivid pigments that softly glimmered in the dark but long neglect had stolen whatever light the luminescent paint once provided, and now only the hint of color was there to be seen. More than once I spent agonizing minutes straining my eyes at some distant shape along the wall of a glimpsed building, only to eventually discern it was a lifeless mural of a towering warrior or prowling hunter, given false life by my nerves and the tense atmosphere of the vague environment around me. There were great gardens set into walled verandas before many of the compounds here, all gone to seed, as with their counterparts back in the lake chamber. The layout of the structures reminded me of apartments in the densest sections of our own urban sprawls, and the more multi-entrance interconnected dwellings I passed, the more I inferred about the beings which had dwelt here. They must be intensely communal, I thought, and yet there was hierarchy, as among a colony of bees or ants, for one row of dwellings was far more opulent and richly carven than its fellows, and sat on a raised tier of the city near the roof, with its palatial compounds seeming to reach far back into the walls of the city's cavern. But even these aristocratic homes were often connected to the lesser dwellings by strange, fully enclosed hexagonal bridges that crisscrossed most of the streets and wound their way between the upper stories of these otherworldly dormitories. The more I saw of them, the more I imagined the beings which had captured me scuttling through them in some remote earlier age. I shuddered to think that some twisted mockery of men had lived and perhaps still lived, like ants down here in the dark, 
their wits and cunning and articulate hands bent to unknown and unknowable arts in perfect unison, in chambers that the sun's blessed light had never touched. Here my fascination with the great minds among the naturalists cursed me, for I began to wonder as I walked whether the things had individual minds or whether they operated under the chains of a sort of collective thought and swarmed against their foes as wasps might a threat to their nests. What alien moral codes and lightless philosophies, if indeed such a term could be applicable, would such a colony of subterranean things have dreamt up? And yet, blind as I was to the nature of the tall men of the caverns then, I knew they must not be wholly unified, for the testaments to the war, or perhaps some societal forebear of the war, which ants had mentioned were all around me. The blackened husks of some flammable portion of the city, whose material of construction I could not then have guessed, was testament to a great act of arson and struggle and I came to theorize the long-gone smoke from this great blaze was why the quartz clouds and other stony glory of the lake chamber's roof were not evident far above me. Swathes of the violently ended dead littered the tighter intersections of the settlement, often astride hastily erected barricades of sturdy stone furniture and the debris of a city under siege. These defenders for they all seemed to be in positions of reaction, like doorways and defensible alleys, were by now mounds of dusty bones and the rotted refuse of rags. These fields of the dead now hosted life all their own, with coiled centipedes the length of my forearm watching coldly as I passed from amongst the bones. Lonely, bloated ants whose rear ends blinked like those of lightning bugs and whose cruel stingers glistened with venom in the half-light marched in and out of the skulls that housed them. Fat rats with eyes too large for their skulls looked on from drains in the roadside and fist-sized beetles grazed in the declining fungus or moss that filled the ditches. The gardens of the abandoned dormitory structures were bedecked with great curtains of webbing, in which the corpses of bats and flying insects hung still and silent. I did not see the spiders that raised them, but the webs were well beyond the height of a man, and in conjunction with the larger lurker I had spotted in the lake chamber, I had no desire to catch a glimpse of either, and steered well clear of the dwellings. I came then upon the stream at the city's center and crossed it along a plain bridge connecting the roadways. Below me, herds of slow-moving, pig-sized creatures which looked remarkably like woodlice dipped in and out of the water, retreating into burrows and thickets of waist-high lichen in the mud that lined the waterway when I lingered too long. Dragonflies darted past now and then in the sector nearest the water pale against the lightless deeps, and yet they made almost no discernible sound, a necessity, I suppose, for traversing the gloom undetected. In my meandering search for another exit to the chamber, I eventually came up onto the raised tier that hosted the most luxurious buildings. Here, the slaughter was more dense than it had been in other quarters and it seemed every inch of ground had been fought for. Bones littered the road dense as cobbles in many places, and among the dead, great black bulks rose up like hillocks from the pale carpet of the slain. The massive desiccated carapaces of some great insects or crustaceans by the looks, skewered with many thrown spears of metal-tipped chitin. Perhaps beasts of war, loosed by the defenders during the final stand. This area was lit better than any other, and gradually I realized a great deal of the light was spilling out from the largest of the structures in the row, which boasted a great open face ringed by carved stony protrusions that gave the impression the entrance was a vast, yawning mouth. This grand entryway opened onto a sort of communal space, 
something I assumed immediately must be a church or temple of some kind. The broad chamber sat slightly lower than the street outside, and looking down into it, I saw that the floor was lined with shallow stony cups or depressions, which I assumed were meant to host squatting worshippers. Great mushrooms tall as small trees from the surface had been grown in big pots set into the walls, and their gills glowed a soft lavender, dousing the whole scene in an eerie, chromatic haze. At the far end, atop a great raised dais, had once been a terrible but elegantly crafted glass or crystal idol of some kind, but it had been toppled and rested in pieces upon the floor amidst a pool of dead skeletons bedecked in the gilded finery of clergy or shamans. The idol was huge and of segmented body. It seemed to have been reared up on some of its many legs, its several pairs of pincers raised high in exaltation above a head that seemed more a cluster of fragile antennae than a discernible skull. But as I say, this giant had been torn down and now rested in ruin amidst the bones of its attendants. In its place, not carved but painted on the back wall in a coppery and chipped substance I was certain even at that distance was ancient blood, was a vast and even more vague shape of tendrils and feelers and teeth, like a devilfish, splayed with its tentacles wide along the stone canvas. This bloody painting had not ended there, for what I guessed to be text in a blocky, partly pictographic script had been crudely daubed over the etched texts of the prior temple, near black against the weird haze of the mushrooms that lit it. My spine straightened as I drank in the scene, and my hair stood on end. It was an eerie and unnerving spectacle, to be sure, but all of this city, and the underworld which housed it, were unnerving. There was something more, something wrong. As I stood still and scanned the room from the street, and drank in no movement even of beasts among the refuse of the civilization which had once worshipped there, I heard, faint as a dying breeze, the words of a deep and resonant voice ring out from a source unseen in the black halls and apertures at the rear of the chamber. I could not discern what it said, but I swear to this day the syllables and tone had the suggestion of English about them. The unseen eyes I had felt upon me throughout the city felt all the more present then, and my breath seemed to catch in my throat, as if even that was too loud for the gaping hush which followed. I did not linger, but I also did not run. Whether hallucinatory or not, I had the forethought to know I would only draw attention to myself by fleeing, and perhaps injure myself in the dark during my rush. Rather, I backed away until I had inched far enough along the street to be out of sight of the open-air temple chamber. Only then, when no following voice rang out in pursuit, and no other noise suggested movement in the temple, did I truly turn back to the task at hand and continue my search for an exit. My path took me down the other side of the raised tier, and eventually to what looked like a great gatehouse set into the side of the chamber. The doors which had once secured the city against the section of tunnel causeway beyond had been shattered, and their rubble gathered dust in the shadow of the tunnel mouth. A bridge over a bend in the cavern's stream formed a sort of second line of defense, and that bridge was strewn with yet more bony ruin. Staring out into the tunnel beyond, just as dark as the first, I had time to realize I was likely in for another very long walk, and given I had bumped into no water in the first section of the causeway, I decided I needed to descend to the stream and drink well enough to last me some time. I approached the bridge and looked down into the gully that hosted the stream. The lichen scrub was less dense here, and I felt fortunate for the giant woodlice were nowhere to be seen, and the stream ran clear and noisy here, 
free of stagnant pools or repellent breeding grounds for flying insects. I left the embers in the mushroom cap I carried and my hammer beside the jacket along the road to free my hands and picked a cautious way down along the muddy bank. And before long, I had sunk those hands into the lukewarm water, my thirst finally catching up with me after so long spent wandering. I was lost in the simple comfort of the moment and did not notice motion off to my side in the shadows beneath the bridge until I rose to leave. I looked over, my peripheral vision having picked up some trace or flicker in the murk. But at first I saw nothing to warrant my glance. The creek gurgled out of the dark into the soft moss light of the other side without being broken, and no shape stood in the shadows along the ground. But then I discerned that which I had taken to be rocks in the current were the hollow, slightly translucent shells of some of the giant wood lice, scattered like dishes after a feast. After that, as my heart struggled to keep pace, my eyes caught another flicker, directly this time, as a strand or string hanging from above seemed to dance and twitch outward from the underside of the bridge, in my direction. I looked up. Immediately, I recognized that it was no strand of vine, no hanging fungal tendril. There were two long and tapering things dancing in the darkness, moving with a life of their own in a world which had never known wind, and glistening with the dull sheen of an insect's skin. Antennae or feelers of some kind thrown down from some hiding something in the black pool of sightless obfuscation on the bottom of the bridge. Long and delicate, they were almost twice my height. Yet, whatever was using them to test the air was absolutely still, and made not a sound to contest the low gurgle of the creek beneath it. Again they twitched, and this time I backed slowly away, just as I had done at the temple. I went up the incline on my rear, my hands caked with the silty mud of the shore, my eyes ever on the feelers where they waved in the open air beneath the bridge. I crested the top and wound back to the road, but always kept my back to the exit gate. No movement or sound issued from beneath the bridge, at least not that I heard over the low murmur of running water. I stooped, back still towards the dark of the causeway, and retrieved the improvised jacket-turned pack, keeping my scavenged hammer close. I dipped a hand down into the jumble and produced the candle I had used in the earlier tunnel. I lit it, each motion or forced look downward at my work matched by an equal glance at the bridge, where still no motion betrayed I had been noticed. The embers of the slow-burning gills in the mushroom cap were low, then, but I managed to get the wick going after a series of sputtering, nervous breaths to fuel the heat. Another glance at the bridge and another jolt of relief as nothing met my eyes. I stood, planting the candle once more in the mushroom cap to form a perch with which to hold the candle. Another look to the bridge, and another sigh of relief. I bound the arms of the bundled jacket about my neck, so that it would hang against my back. Another look to the bridge, and yet another flood of soothed nerves. Finally, I crouched and took up the hammer, each move and each process undertaken with all the noiseless caution I could muster. Another look to the bridge, but this time... There was no soothing relief. There was no silent sigh as I counted myself safe. There was only quiet, barely contained panic. I had looked away to find the hammer's haft for perhaps a count of two, and yet the thing beneath the bridge had needed no more time than that, and it had moved in absolute silence. The thing was perched along the stone rail of its hideaway, stone still, It was more bleak than midnight and glistened in the dull glow of the cavern, my small and insignificant flame dancing in the reflections along its inky carapace at that distance. 
It was spiny and angular, with long rear legs that seemed poised for motion. Eight feet long through the body, perhaps, with lengthy limbs and feelers that made it seem far larger. It was sleek and built for motion, I could tell. Even through the dark, it gave all the impressions of a graceful, cold, predatory poise. And yet, other than that it seemed vaguely like a massive cricket, I could determine no details further than what I have listed in that moment, for the cavern was, as ever, bleak, and my candle served more to blind me than to cast light upon it. What I could see was that its huge eyes, black as its body, were cast my way, my candle a pinprick of white amidst their seas of murky gloom. I stood there, waiting for it to move for a long while, my fist clenched on the haft of the hammer I held, trying to steel myself for a fight I had no doubts I would lose. Running was no option either, for it had crested the bridge in a wink, and I could see by the silhouette of its body that it might well be able to cover the forty or fifty yards between us in a single bound of its powerful legs. But it never did move. It just watched on, statuesque and terrible, even its antennae frozen in place. I stepped back, slow and methodical, and still it did not budge. I repeated the motion, cautious as ever I've been before or since, until my heels thumped against the rubble of the shattered causeway gate. Even then, I did not look away. I merely stumbled and probed, backwards footfall by backwards footfall, until I'd crested the stones and jagged bones, and leveled out on the pockmarked roadway beyond. Each motion brought the fear that the thing would follow, but it did not pursue. I backed into the tunnel, too focused on the immediate threat to worry about the dark or the noises I had heard during my crossing of the first causeway. I merely kept my eyes towards the faint glow of the city cavern and the ebon shape that lurked there, until distance made it a pinprick, and the moss light grew all but imperceptible against the gleam of the candle I held. Even when I could no longer see the creature, I kept the candle held aloft in its direction, sliding cautious and careful backwards all the while. I bumped some corpse or fallen masonry along the route now and then, but the way was mostly clear and I never allowed myself to get so invested in progress that I lost track of the void that closed in around me as I backed down the tunnel. A mile and more I walked, and no sound or motion teased the tunnel as I moved. But the silence that haunted the city chamber still reigned here, and I still felt as if hostile and cunning eyes were upon me. I would guess an hour passed that way, and more miles of the tunnel fell away in my wake, but such guesses are cheap in a world with no sunrise or sunset, especially when nerves are frayed. But it ended when, after a longer stint than most, my candle flickered out, whether by my own mistake of twitchy motion or whether by pure chance, and left me stalled in the dark. I had become practiced with this in the earlier tunnels, and brought the wick to the barely perceptible embers once more, praying that it would catch quickly. On the second try, it did. There was a soft scratching as two long and tapering feelers skittered back into the dark beyond the flame, and I rose to see the familiar pinpricks of light reflected back at me in staring eyes amidst the shadow. How much ground it had covered in the darkness, how close it had trailed me during my retreat, I could not know. But I now knew I would not so easily escape it, and though it still seemed hesitant to take me head on or approach the stark light of the tiny flame, I realized my candle was growing short indeed, and that at some point soon I would need to replace it. This changed the way I thought about my predicament, and I began to pay closer attention to my surroundings as I continued my slow backpedal, and the familiar eyes of my unwanted companion faded away. 
I paid closer heed to the occasional debris along the floor and the occasional breaks in the masonry along the walls, counting each agonizing second on the move without discovering any useful tool, my candle struggling all the while. At last, after another period of exhausting retreat, I spotted a ragged alcove just before a broad intersection in the causeway, a split in the otherwise smooth tunnel's side, with black shadow beyond. I leaned in just long enough to determine there was space within. It was a barren cavity in the stone, perhaps seven feet deep and a couple wide, with a low and cramped entrance, perhaps expanded by the things which roamed the tunnels over the years the route had been in decline and disuse. I had seen similar places before, always counting them as potential hiding spots for the barefoot runners I heard, and giving them a wide berth. Now, finding one empty, I put the vague and desperate plan I had cooked up into action. I withdrew to the far wall across from the aperture and carefully set my candle and its bed of coals upon the floor there. I then made for the hole, crouched low and scuttled swiftly inside, hammer in hand. I swung the makeshift pack from my back and left it wedged in the tiny entrance, blocking most of the faint and sputtering candlelight from across the causeway. Then I stood as straight as I could, as far back as I could, having to bend at the neck to accommodate the unforgiving stone of the ceiling. I breathed low and quiet, and moved as little as possible, biding my time. There was part of me that hoped the stalker would find the empty hall and go on its way, finding easier prey to sate itself upon. But I knew even in that ragged state that such thoughts were foolishness, and that it would push through my flimsy barrier and try to get in at me. But the hole was too small to allow it easy passage, and I anticipated what was to come. Even so, the wait was agonizingly long, and the beast did not act until the fading light from my dying candle had gone completely cold. Minutes passed in the black, still and silent. Then stirring at the aperture beneath me, a thin strand of unseen feeler inserted through the gap in the shoddy barricade brushing my face and limbs as the hunter delicately and mutely probed the space within. It tasted the sweat and fear of me in there, as I had known deep down it would. There was a scuffling in the blind black as something shoved the pack from the entrance, and began thumping its carapace against the ragged doorway. What happened next I obviously cannot describe visually. The absolute shadow of the deepest reaches of the earth saw to that. But I had planned for the moment, and now that the thing had finally come, I was ready. Unable to hold the hammer overhand in the tight quarters, I held my looted weapon like a pendulum out before me, with the head downward, and brought it crashing down for the ground when I heard the noise of the thing pressing in. It was too large to fit inside, but was clearly desperate enough for a meal to probe with its head, mandible snapping audibly in the murk as it strained for limbs and flesh it could not quite reach. I struck it as if driving a fence post or churning butter into the ground, and I struck it for a long, long time. Sometimes the hammer's head met stone and clanged like a sonorous bell, but most of my strikes in that cubby of shorn rock crackled against spiny exoskeleton and shattered chitin. I struck again and again, long enough that my shoulders ached for days afterward. Though I did not perceive it, I must have screamed like the enraged apes naturalists describe as I did it, for I struggled to hear for a long while and my throat was ragged for a week. When, in time, I tapered off into an exhausted huff and began to finally catch my breath, I heard no motion from below me. The fluttering feelers, which had danced like feeble fingers across my face early in the struggle as the beast beneath thrashed and kicked in vain, had fallen still. The ground of the space was slick with sticky ichor, 
and when I pressed blind against the mass blocking the entrance with the hammer, a great heave sent the sound of bony plates grinding on cold stone echoing down the empty halls. I found the dislodged pack, fished around within, and eventually put hands on my flint. I ducked out of the aperture, nearly tripped on the broken form of the unseen hunter, and then spent breathless minutes slumped against the far wall near where I thought I'd left the candle, not quite believing that I was still alive. When time set me loose from my panic, I probed around until I found the mushroom cap, which had gone entirely cold. I caught the sparks from my striker with it, counted yet another string of blessings as I roused some small simmer among the singed gills, and lit my second candle, a process that took probably half an hour, despite the simplicity I give it in words here. No noises troubled me in the tunnels during that time, and perhaps because of the scope of the victory I had just won, I did not think of them just then. The light revealed the broken hunter was indeed cricket-like. Its head was pulped and the chitin of it was in shards, so I could not say exactly what its jaws or eyes had looked like up close. But the corpse was longer than my body, even with the head pounded off, and, testament to the desperate and animal state of mind my environment had placed me in, the thick and spiny rear legs immediately struck me as a potential food source. With some effort, I twisted both off and cut away the thicker uppermost portions with the obsidian knife I had taken, leaving me with two three-foot segments of armor-encrusted meat to carry forward with me on the journey. But I had no stomach for more travel just then. I sat down in the low candlelight, exhausted to my bones, and ate one of the few cooked lobster crawlers I had carried out from the lake chamber with me, tasting almost nothing, food having already become a weary necessity rather than a joyous reprieve. I crawled back into the stained alcove, replaced my flimsy jacket-pack barricade, and doused my light before slumbering heavy for a long while. Four. The Jungle I slept in one great run, untroubled by nightmares or doubtful stirrings in the not-quite night of my makeshift room. As with the meal before sleep, the wild animal's simple need for rest had overcome me, and I had slept the thoughtless sleep of a beast which boasts no imagination. And yet, once I had risen, eaten, started another of my dry mushroom caps to smoldering in the dark so that the last candle could be maintained, and eventually continued my way along the causeway tunnel, the accursed hauntings of man's nervous innermost thoughts crept back in upon me. The vitalist invulnerability I had felt after crushing the head of my hunter was fast wiped away. Again, the bowels of the earth yawned black and menacing about me, and my mind painted the worst possible sources to half-heard echoes that reached me through the intervening miles of intersecting tunnels. The walk was mostly uneventful that first hour or so, though, and save stumbling upon a trickle of water down the way through some crack in the ceiling overhead which allowed me to drink, and hearing a particularly shrill scream rippling outward from some unknowable place down an adjoining section of causeway, I have little to recall save raised nerves and anxious thoughts. I did not walk long before coming out of the causeway tunnels once more into yet another city cavern, this one much smaller than the first. Like the town along the lakeshore, it seemed to be a smaller annex of the larger and more fortified city core, 
and lacked the stormed gatehouses and foreboding tiered construction of its grander counterpart. The low moss light was much the same as it had been before, so I was able to douse my candle here, something I was not happy about given the nature of the cricket thing's apparent fear of the flame, but which was necessary to preserve my last light for whatever would follow this glum, moss-lit cavern. There were far fewer signs of struggle between the tall men here, and, to my delight, much more activity in the air above me as bugs and bats flitted to and fro. Something like the song of small frogs grumbled from the spring-fed fountain in the center of the dormitories, and as I knelt and drank there, I was amazed to spot the subtle motion of many tiny glittering fish in the water, eking out a life in their confined pool long after their masters had faded away. The clouds of quartz and other strange crystal which had coated sections of the lake chamber roof rained here as well, their soft glitter untainted by the smoke of long-dead fires. The giant woodlice were far more prolific and bumbled aimlessly from mud patch to mud patch, perhaps feasting on guano from the hunting bats above. I watched each crevice for fishing antennae, and wheeled around to ensure at every corner that I was not followed through the dust-scattered ruin of the gloomy streets. The vague outline of what I took to be a spider half my size skittered across one of the distant quartz clouds overhead, but otherwise the sheen and patter of hunters was absent, and so far as the ground went, the suburb seemed remarkably safe. This cavern had only one other exit which was visible to me, and it was almost directly across from the one I'd come through. That end of the strange suburb was dominated by the most striking feature of the town, an overgrown and untended botanical display of some kind, which seemed mostly composed of fungal life. The largest of the mushrooms there were much like the ones I had seen in the desecrated temple the day prior, but these seemed to have flourished and grown unhindered by pot or roof. Many soared the better part of a hundred feet to the ceiling, and like their temple kindred, their gills gleamed down through the mist above like sunlight through cloud cover, half visible but giving off enough violet ambient shine to leave that end of town almost well lit. These copses of mushrooms flanked either side of the causeway exit like guardians. The spiny and spongy foliage about their feet was dense, and shuffled occasionally as great millipedes as bumbling as their woodlice compatriots scuttled here and there in the damp cover. I stared into this fungal brush for a long while, debating whether I might gather fuel for a proper fire there. Eventually, though, in spite of the seemingly placid nature of the millipedes there, I opted not to risk the waist-high thickets, and instead turned for the exit to the tunnel. But I found that the comparative brightness of this suburb chamber had thus far blinded me to the most intriguing thing of all. For far down the causeway tunnel, sized identically to the menacing black gulfs which had opened before me in prior chambers, was a stark and strong glow. There was a light at the end of this tract of tunnel, and as I stood looking on in stunned silence, I realized it did not flicker or move. It was truly there, and moreover, it was not some potentially dangerous torch or lantern or luminescent hunter traversing the way up ahead. It was an opening onto real, bright light, the first I had seen in many days. I had not, I suppose, had a true goal since falling into the lake chamber, save, of course, survival. I had resolved to keep moving, but I had had no planned route, and had known nothing of real hope since my journey through this underworld had begun. Perhaps it was this long dearth of real hope that made me such a fool in that moment, for as I saw the light, I firmly took it to be the sun, an exit not just to the dark ruins in which I found myself, but to the caves as a whole. I felt warmth and the soft moisture of what I took to be open air as I began to sprint the length of the tunnel, 
heedless of sound, sprawling several times as I clipped rubble or remains in the deep shadows of the causeway. I smelled new and, to my desperate nose, floral scents, and heard running water as it cascaded down some great fall somewhere ahead of me. Freedom was here, I thought. I had been delivered. And yet, on some level, I had known all along that I must have been very, very deep down. Had I had the wherewithal to stop and think, it would have been obvious to me that this could not have been the light of the sun, and the warmth, so at odds with the blustery winter I had left behind overhead, could not be the heat given by the glorious light of a natural day. But my thirst for daylight and birdsong and breeze was so great that I allowed myself to be swept by it down the tunnel, a full mile and more, until at last I burst from between two great shattered gates, waded through a tangle of bones and corroded weaponry, and found myself in the midst of a jungle, something akin to the descriptions of the great forests of the southern hemisphere. But drunk as I was upon hope, even I could realize that this was no ordinary forest. From thickets of fleshy, fern-like growths that hung fat with moisture along the slick and soupy ground, soaring mushrooms and stalks of fungal growths rose like titan trees, their bulbs and caps gleaming gold and red and purple through the mist that swirled overhead. Moss grew thick as grass here, and portions of the beds flared into dim green or yellow light before sinking into darkness, as if the whole biosphere thrummed with a single heartbeat and the moss light was fed by it. Great petaled clusters of flower-like fungus which dripped and oozed the scents of sweetness and decay were capped with buzzing crowns of flies and other insects which feasted on their produce. A myriad of vines of some sort hung down from the clouds of moisture above, with glinting, bulbous protrusions shifting through a spectrum of vivid colors along their lengths, and hordes of half-glimpsed bats and bugs, some small as normal specimens, and some large enough to harry a grown man, darting between them. Spears of dark fungus grew like reeds alongside a true river, fed by a roaring waterfall a ways off which thundered down out of the haze overhead and crashed into a rocky channel that carried the rush out of sight amidst the dazzling foliage. All this I drank in from a defensible platform halfway up the wall, occupied by the causeway exit. The forest occupied a cavern, but I knew it was far larger than even the lake chamber had been even if the fog and mist of the waterfall made it impossible to guess exactly how large it was. The sound of massed animal life and roaring currents alone told me as much as it echoed endlessly in deafening symphony through the depths. So massive was it that it boasted a geography all its own, with the jagged cliffs and ledges of the walls giving the miles-long expanse the impression of a valley and ragged hills of stone thrusting up from the jungle floor to tower unseen above, perhaps connected to the unglimpsed ceiling, like great cave columns. Had my brief fantasy of escape not rendered the discovery a disappointment, I might have seen the beauty in it, for despite the dangers I knew must lurk within, it was indeed beautiful. The inborn lights of its creatures and the fungal life growing therein gave the chamber the gleam of daylight, and their vivid colors danced in the mist, giving the vast space a surreal and ephemeral atmosphere, a dazzling array of moving colors and blinking lights that made my head spin after so long in the blackness. A ramp marked the end of the causeway, and I saw that below, it had been mostly eaten by the fungal growth which dominated the chamber. The ruins of men beneath the stone, it seemed, were sometimes eaten away as effectively as they are in the light of day. But I didn't descend immediately. I had to lurk above, perhaps falsely confident due to my higher vantage point, and allow myself to come to terms with what I was seeing. As shock gradually wore off, my purpose became the planning of a route, 
and the careful observation of landmarks that might help me navigate once I was down in the tangle and my line of sight became strangled in the jungle beneath the fungal canopy. I saw that there were long shapes stalking the riverbank, like giant serpents at first glance, but at length discernible as many-legged centipedes, which hunted the amphibians and woodlice and bloated grubs that writhed in the mud and guano there. Moreover, large translucent lurkers would occasionally surface from the water itself, glistening and beady-eyed, seeming to watch for prey along the shore. Slow and ponderous wasp things with glowing torsos as large as a man's flitted down from above the clouds and perched upon stones in the water to drink now and then, and huge crickets, perhaps juvenile examples of the stalker which had chased me from the city chamber, emerged from the brush for much the same reason. When prey was taken along the water, it was taken, for the most part, in silence, and offered no vocal protest to its killer as it was devoured, usually alive. The sheer tumult of motion down there meant that, despite the relatively easy navigation the riverbanks would provide, I would be a fool to travel alongside it for long. The forest itself, thickest in the lowest reaches of the cavern, was no better. Though one could not see the wildlife that hunted and died there from on high due to the sheer density of the growth, one could see it move now and then as a chase was initiated, or hear the clatter of disturbed mud and stone and fungus when one of the hunted fell victim to its pursuer. Some of these pursuers must have been heavy indeed, for their passing shook even the tree-sized mushrooms they brushed in passing. The mystery of what dwelt there was only half the horror that dissuaded me from navigating the valley floors of the chamber, for losing my way in so thick a tangle seemed inevitable, and given I didn't truly have any solid goal to begin with, such aimlessness seemed a death sentence. The sole survivable option seemed to me to be the cliff sides along the edges of the chamber. Their feet seemed still and placid by comparison to the rest of the landscape, and while I could not see the detail of them in the misty distance any better than I could observe the jungle floor below me, I was willing to gamble on a place I hoped was calm over the cavalcade of death I saw awaited me elsewhere. I resolved to descend the ramp from the gate platform, skirt the edge of the jungle around the carven base off to my left, and then find the cave wall behind and follow it around like a maze's outer edge. The mightiest of the columns of stone that soared for the unseen ceiling above in the middle distance was alive with swarms of some softly glowing fly, and I anticipated using its light as a sort of center point, a distant yardstick with which to measure my progress around the eaves of the cavern. With one last look over my shoulder into the blackness I'd left behind me, I doused the embers in my mushroom cap, carefully wrapped my candle into my pack with the rest of my supplies, and inched down the slick and treacherous ramp into the tangle, hammer at the ready. The first steps into the moss and lichen and fungal fronds that governed the ground were treacherous and slick and that would frame my experience throughout the jungle caverns. The moisture and fleshy texture of even the leafy-looking fungal growth meant that each footfall pressed ooze from the undergrowth like blood from a broken body. Many times, when the growth was luminescent, the gleaming pigment would stain my soles for a time, and even when I managed to find rock outcrops and ridges to walk along, I would leave tracks along my path in a vivid gold or a noxious pink. Tiny mosquitoes, or something with similar habits, alighted on my exposed skin and drank deep, and each moment was spent swiping at my neck and hands, as much to disturb the feeding bugs as to wick away the sweat dragged out by the brutal humidity. Lightning bugs as tiny as gnats clogged up my eyes now and then, and had to be washed away in the waters of small feeder streams, which tumbled down the walls and cliff faces I hugged, leaving my eyes a watery and agitated mess. 
Centipedes lurched from crevices in the rock to strike at my hands as I grasped for stability on the ledges, and great army columns of glinting ants carrying spoils up the wall to unseen outposts above the mists were agitated to pursuit by my passing. A dragonfly as long as my arm made an unforeseen swoop at me from the mist overhead, but it had either mistaken me for something else or was scared by the wild swipe I took at it with my hammer, and after brushing my head with its long tail, it left for the heights and did not return. But the most repellent element of my trip along the cliffside walls of the jungle was the presence of another beast which I am unsure is a beast. For the more I have seen of it during my time underground, the less I believe it to be an animal at all. During a stop at a tiny waterfall amidst a clean crag and dark stone to drink, my shoulder was brushed from behind by a lithe and barely perceptible appendage, one I immediately assumed to be the feeler of some massive insectile hunter. But when I wheeled around, I at first saw only the bloated and malodorous fungal growth of the cavern. It was only when something twitched in the panoply of color that I realized there was a slow and ponderous giant right before me, half buried in the foliage, and so subtle in its motion that it seemed still if one did not watch it close enough. The giant was, to put it simply, a set of light and flexible limbs extended from beneath a mushroom cap the size of a small house back in Richmond. Despite the fact that these tender limbs were only a few inches thick, they must have been strong indeed, for they knelt and probed and slowly crept beneath the bulk of the fungal shell they carried, without wavering or trembling. There was no head to discern, nor was there a body save the mushroom cap. There was merely a thick nest of ragged tissue or tendrils hanging from beneath, into which the legs disappeared a sort of terrestrial jellyfish. The legs and shape gave me the impression that it was a mighty crab, and the mushroom was its shell, but the lack of chitin on the limbs and the strange, almost accidental bumbling of the giant's movements dissuaded me from that notion over time. Since that first intrepid encounter, I have seen the things planted upon the corpses of the dead, or of the fallen fungal trees of the underworld. The crawling giants do not hunt, and do not move quickly enough to do so, and thus posed little danger to me in my travels. But, as I have hinted, time has made me speculate they are not crabs or spiders at all, but rather a sort of carrion plant or fungus that has developed the ability to browse for new scavenged provender after its current source has been extinguished. Regardless, I describe it now from the relative safety of the present. In the moment, I had no time to muse on what it was. I just saw a gigantic crawler on the jungle's eaves, whose strange tendril limb had softly brushed me in the clamor of the chaotic fungal tangle, and I fled further on down the rocks, relieved to look back down the way and see that the giant was merely lingering about the falls, perhaps taking a drink. These crawling giants would rise up from the forest floor, sometimes indistinguishable from their immobile cousins, until the moment of motion, a sight I became accustomed to as I traversed the dense thickets about me. Some were large as whales or sailing ships, glimpsed like phantoms as they bumbled somewhere amidst distant mist, and others were no larger than a dinner plate. They paid no mind to the wildlife around them, or to my passing, and they only drew close when seeking water nearby. I, for my part, would have entirely disregarded them as harmless, which I suppose they are, in truth, were it not for the indescribable stink that followed them. The fleshy brown or ochre mushroom caps upon the backs of the crawling giants were pockmarked with deep pores and from these pores wept a sort of red or white ooze. It coated the caps and left a slick trail behind the giants as they shuffled from one place to another, across the cavern floor. Other than to say the stink was of decay, 
I cannot go farther, for as I have said, it cannot be described. To attempt that is to lose the potent revulsion it inspires in translation to the page. What I will say is that I wept agitated tears from inflamed eyes, bled flowing mucus from an irritated nose, and vomited compulsively to the point of exhaustion the few times I was within several feet of the thing's slime trails, and learned well to steer clear of them after my first few encounters. During that first accidental meeting with one of the crawling giants, the symptoms were mild for the quick retreat and the fact it had been facing me on its approach to the water source meant I did not garner much exposure to the ichor it expelled. But later stumbling along the cliff bottoms were not so fortunate, and the smaller specimens especially, their trails being harder to spot, made for many vomit-strewn detours along my treacherous trip. I traveled for many hours, taking rests only infrequently. One such rest was spent building a fire out of the fronds of a flaky and relatively dry fungal life form that grew like tiered shelving along the rocks at my side, over which I cooked the legs of the hunter I had slain along the causeway, which I glutted myself upon like an animal, watching jealously any movement in the scrub that hinted another might attempt to steal my meal. Occasionally, a ruined building, clearly shaped by the same hands which had reared the cities at my back, reared up from the shroud of cloud and flora. But these were rare, and even more so than their cousins in the darker chamber, served now only as houses and hives for the great insect life hunting the valley floor. Every step of the way, whether in travel or reprieve, I kept my eyes on the largest central pillar miles distant, whose outline loomed mountain-like against the yellow-green haze, and whose location kept me roughly aware of the progress I'd made. I was exhausted by the time I reached the far end of the mighty room, and after miles and miles on my feet, fighting slick conditions and perching on smooth stone, I was near collapse. Exhaustion had set in, for it had been perhaps a day since I had slept. But there was no easy place I could spot to hole up or bed down, and I resolved to keep going, despite being near the end of my rope. The chamber's far end was a rough intersection with two other massive chambers, and the river which flowed through the first forked in half to carve its way into the further rooms. One was narrow, by comparison to its fellows, only half a mile across, and seemed to taper off into an obscure, darker region ahead, whereas the other seemed to continue down a narrow canyon for a ways before opening up into a yawning jungle expanse as vast as the first. Not wishing to re-enter the dark, I chose the canyon route to the larger chamber. But the narrow nature of the connecting canyon meant I would have to climb back down to the lower reaches of the jungle, for the cliff faces I'd been hugging pinched the river tight in the gorge between rooms. As I approached, I saw less of the chaos the dense foliage along the banks had hosted elsewhere, and I told myself I might pass quick and unseen down the crag and be out and away before anything dangerous took notice of me. But I was noticed, and I would come to regret my assumptions. The hollow, reed-like fungal flutes that choked the waterway mostly died away in the crag, to be replaced by wispy blue and violet mushrooms about twice my height, whose caps were frilled with streamers that twitched and wobbled in the still air. The undergrowth was mostly rock, for the mud and muck seemed confined to the open riversides, but the rock was studded with barnacle things that probed the air with long tongues before snapping shut as one drew close. After reaching the riverside and testing that the moving tassels upon the mushrooms were not poisoned or otherwise hostile, my progress was spent crunching on these barnacle things, my feet aching in my boots as I strained my eyes against the myriad colors and tried to keep my wits about me. But the sickly sweet scent of distant death that haunted so much of the flora in this cavern system was thicker than ever in the crag amidst those blue wisps, 
and my head grew light. Colors danced at the corner of my vision, perhaps more vividly than was normal, and my skull, already racked with a tense headache born of the day's exertion, seemed ready to split with each pump of my slowing heart. My eyes watered slightly there, and as I recognized my situation and picked up my pace under the impression escaping the crag might alleviate the sensation, I slipped and slid more frequently, for my balance and reactions had sorely suffered. It felt as if my whole body was encased by mud, and the more energy I put into my increasingly drowsy push for the far end of the crag and the gleaming promise of open space beyond, the more dreamlike and staid my attempts to move became. The trunks and streamers of the mushroom growths overhead and the subtle mist rising off the river to my right only enhanced my sleepwalker's sensations, and at length I went to my knees upon a flat ledge along the water, wary enough to find a safe place to balance, but desperate enough to catch my ever shallower breath to slow my progress through the chromatic manse. I was over halfway through, and yet the span before me up the river, more visible to me now that I had dropped low beneath the streamers, seemed insurmountable then. I could not walk straight or catch my breath, much less finish the run for the far side. Perhaps I could sleep, came the thought in my mind, unwelcome there, but present all the same, as if it had been inserted through my ear by some hostile force to gnaw at the roots of my mind. My eyes were heavy, though. A small rest would not kill me now after so fortunate and fruitful a journey, I found myself thinking. And though the core of me cried out that I should not relent, my aching body seemed to move of its own accord, and I started to slump slowly down toward the cool, damp stone, as if meaning to sleep right there within arm's length of the water. Then I saw movement off to my side, a vision that cut through the haze of my foggy mental state like a knife to drag me some small fraction of the way back into wakefulness. Instinct runs strong in me. My years underground have certainly taught me that, and this was no exception. My blood pumping faster despite whatever spores or gases I was breathing in, and my vision clearing up just enough to give me a vague glimpse of what was coming for me. I had just come to lay on my side, my face against the rock of the shore, and my eyes cast outward over the calm surface of the river as it lazily drifted onward towards my destination at the end of the crag. A gray shape speckled with greens and whites, so similar to the rocky riverbed that it must have been invisible through the crystalline waters prior to making its move, broke the surface. It moved slowly and methodically, biding its time, apparently used to taking the beasts that wandered into its stretch of the river unaware and unprepared. As I twitched to try and snap myself into motion and fought battles in my own mind against the dream-like fugue that had overtaken me, the image of the thing from the water began to take shape. It was vaguely like a caterpillar, bloated and undulating, seeming to swell and deflate in places as whatever internal mechanisms moved it shifted it along. It had horns and ridges along its back, some of which flared red with excitement as it slouched forward through the water. This vile body, still mostly obscured by the sheen of the surface of the water, was fronted by a thick and bulbous sort of head, from which glinted asymmetrical clusters of tiny black eyes. This head was gelatinous, and rippled and molded itself to its purpose just like the rest of the thing's body. There was no visible mouth, not at first, but the thing's slow yet steady motion would soon reveal one to me. I had just managed to lift myself up onto one weak elbow and feebly slide an inch or two back from the water when the beast hit the incline of rock upward to the shoreline and rose further from the current as it began to crawl rather than swim. I had known it was large, but I then saw it was huge. 
Water spilled from its grotesque bulk as it ascended, seeming more a maggot than a caterpillar now that I saw the sheer fatty mass of it, segmented like a worm, but barbed with thousands of translucent hairs or spines about its larger crests of red that twitched eagerly as it gave sluggish chase. Rather than the legs of a centipede or the pads of a caterpillar, it had many rows of stunted flippers, and they slapped the stone in a slipshod rhythm as it dragged itself inch by inch onto land. It reared up like a snake as it did so, and I saw that beneath the rubbery camouflage of its back, the underbelly was flaring red like glistening blood, and rippled with some sort of teeth or claws that I imagined it must use to grip the riverbed, and, I supposed, its victims. Clearly visible now as it stood like a striking cobra, beneath the head where those awkward clusters of black eyes glistened and rolled, I at last saw its mouth. The creature was so unlike anything I have seen, even allowing for my former obsession with the texts of naturalists, that I have had some trouble attempting to put its shape into words. But the mouth tests me even more. Best as I can describe, it was a shuddering hole, a sort of sphincter, expanding and contracting. Several tendrils, perhaps tongues or stingers or graspers, flitting in and out as it moved. Rows of ridged things which were not quite teeth were occasionally visible dilating and spasming within, disappearing away into the throat. At one moment, the mouth would be large enough to swallow a man whole. The next, it would be a slit no larger than a coin stood on its end, so subtle that a man might miss its presence. It was agonizingly close to me then, at most fifteen yards away, still trailing water. I had tried twice to get my feet under me again, but they were prickly, as if I had been sitting on them at an odd angle, seeming even weaker than before. Thus, I had settled on backpedaling along the stone on my rear, dragging my hammer and pack pinned under one arm and scuttling bug-like with my three free limbs in a desperate attempt to move. But despite my ridiculous mode of escape, it moved so very slowly that the feeble backpedal I was in kept the distance between us roughly even. The beast would inch forward, body rippling, making no noise save the trickle of water from its glistening flanks and the slap of its flippers upon the stone. And in turn, I would kick off the earth and drag at the stalks of mushrooms with filthy hands, gaining a few inches of my own. Hugging the riverbank so I did not lose my way, and breathing more and more raggedly as I moved, I kept glancing over my shoulder into the distance, where the bluish hue of the crag's wispy mushrooms died away, reminding myself I was already over halfway there, and praying whatever effect the area had on me waned fast once I was out. Slowly toppling mushrooms in my wake, the riverbed slug kept pace, its mouth still ululating in a silent, hungry scream. Sad as this snail's marathon sounds, it was nightmarish to run it. As in nightmare, I was weighed down with artificial chains, and felt at each moment that my pursuer was within arm's reach of me, and sometimes I was right. Twice the beast let its forebody slap down against the stone, making a lunge as if to crush me beneath it and bring its mouth down upon me. But both times it missed my kicking feet by a hand's length at most. In the time the beast would take to right itself and begin its pursuit in earnest again, I would have gained a few yards, and the cycle would begin again. I cannot say how I mustered the focus to remain conscious throughout that awkward chase, Perhaps terror alone carried me through, as I slid back or rolled onto all fours to clamber over rock mounds in the glaring fog. More of the things, most small by comparison to the titan that still lumbered after me, broke the water now and then as we passed. Though they were too slow to catch up and threaten me as the first had, this omnipresent menace perhaps aided me in maintaining my focus for the whole of the sleepy scrabble through the crag. Whether by grace or due to the sheer animal drive to survive another day, 
I eventually scrambled with bloody hands and ragged trousers into the comparatively open air of the next jungle cavern. But I did not stop there to bask, for the slug thing was still close on my heels. I crawled for some time, clinging up along the base of the cliffs as I had done in the previous jungle expanse, and ignoring the burning in my shredded skin and straining lungs. I did not hear its slapping slither give chase for some time, but my heart still beat hard in my chest, and my mind had no room for doubt which might see me killed. But long minutes saw me come to a breathless halt along the cave wall, pinned as I saw a crawling giant in its slick trail of grime submerged in a shallow stream with many juveniles up ahead. Wishing to avoid any further poison than whatever already troubled me, I threw my eyes around in search for escape amongst the tangle of jungle along the slope downward towards the riverside, but I glimpsed no red flares of motion behind me, and, exhausted, sat in silence for a long moment of disbelief, waiting for the slug thing to emerge from the fungal scrub, or crest some jagged hillock in the stony ground. It never appeared, though. Both the slug and the blue canyon in which its kindred thrived in the calmest reaches of the river were now out of sight through the mist and intervening terrain. Shapes which were not there still danced in the far corners of my vision, and a weariness which was not wholly of exhaustion still clouded my thoughts. With the stink of the crawling giants not far off, but simultaneously not so vitriolic that it affected me, I found a small crevice in the stone wall a few dozen yards from them. I was beneath a small overhang, which kept the gravel beneath relatively dry. My head still spinning, I shoved some of this gravel up from my chosen bed to form a loose barrier between me and the cavern beyond. Far from sturdy, but it was all I could manage as my limbs shook and my hands struggled to make intricate motions. I was glad to be in darkness for the first time since coming into the caves. I pressed the jacket pack to the ground as a sort of shoddy, uncomfortable pillow. I had just enough time as consciousness left me to realize the hammer I had carried was no longer with me, almost certainly dropped or jostled loose from my weak grip during the chase. But the lack of a weapon would not truly frighten me until I awoke much later in a state of better clarity. Right then, I knew only groggy misery, and sleep seemed the only cure. Five. Restless. I awoke, as so often drunk with sleep, and perhaps the last vestiges of whatever I had inhaled in the crag to a sharp pain in my calf. I was quickly roused and jostled a span of the gravel which hemmed me in loose, letting light pour into my sleeping cubby. There was something shiny and chitinous fastened to my leg, I saw, though it remained wholly still until I sidled out into the light and made to remove it. While I slept, a centipede several feet long had crawled in after me, perhaps seeking its own hiding place. But finding a ready store of meat sleeping soundly within, it had coiled itself around my lower leg and planted its jaws in the flesh. Shock gave me speed in finding the rusty, broken knife I'd been given, and with some effort I cut the thing's head off as it thrashed around, never once letting loose. But once it had been decapitated, the head itself still didn't let up, and had to be plucked and carefully sliced out of the skin, mostly with the help of the obsidian shard. The head had been almost entirely buried in the meat of my leg, and the hole the removal left on the back of my calf was nearly three inches wide. 
I suppose now, in retrospect, the thing must have had some venom about it that numbed the area it was dining on, for I felt little throughout the ordeal. But I did know that the sodden air of the jungle chambers would eventually cause problems, as it so often did for men who fought Indians down in Florida. So, I spent over an hour making a small fire among a cluster of nearly dry leaves or fronds of some green fungus along the wall, feeding it with hastily gathered fuel until I had heated the end of a long stone enough to burn the skin. I then singed the wound as best I could and made to go. The interlude with the centipede was one among many. I swatted a long, shrimp-like bug that had silently landed on my neck away to find it had left a dense, itching bump behind after whatever feeding it had done. I found that I had to scratch around inside my ears regularly to disrupt the swarms of tiny black gnats that congregated within, their vibrations drowning out the sound of the fungal forest all about me. The rocky edges of the chambers were slick with the excretions of a sort of gigantic snail that dwelt along the roof, descending on occasion to find water or supplement food on the jungle floor, and though none troubled me, I certainly stumbled more than once when I failed to pick out their slime trails in the omnipresent damp. And at each stirring in the fungal fronds about me, I missed sorely the hammer I had dropped and clutched tight the tiny obsidian knife I carried. All this prevented me from ever truly becoming confident or comfortable in my new surroundings. As I picked my way through chamber after chamber, some smaller and some larger, but all teeming with life and color and the sounds of living and dying, I was ever reminded that I had no place in all that chaos, and that my continued existence within the tangle relied as much upon good fortune as it did on any resourcefulness of mine. When six or eight hours saw me prematurely exhausted, and I bedded down beneath a rock overhang at the terminus of a miles-long, thin expanse of jungle chamber that seemed to have no exit, I was spent. The gouge on my leg that the centipede had wrought had begun to throb hours earlier, and after days on the move over unforgiving and slick stone, my many near falls and awkward footsteps had left my limbs sore and trembling. I'm certain the blood-sucking flyers of the forest didn't help matters either. But I had a fresh mushroom cap taken from the village back in the lake chamber to start a roaring fire beneath the more porous and flammable chunks of fungal trunks and caked lichen. I could gather from the misty eaves of the glowing forest, and before long, I was drying my stockings and warming my battered feet before a stone fire pit that radiated a toasty warmth which was at odds with my surroundings. Countless fires on our trip westward had inured me to lighting in difficult conditions, and to eating less than stellar feed. Today's feed was one of the wood lice from the forest floor which strayed too close to the edge of the foliage, the killing of which was a grueling endeavor after I managed to flip it over, as my small knife had trouble dispatching it once it was curled into a protective ball. But, after many clumsy cuts and a bludgeoning with a large, sharp stone, the young piglet-sized woodlouse was dead, and I prepared it in much the same way I had the crawlers from the lake chamber. I propped the beast low over my fire upon two flat stacks of shale and fallen stone, still in its carapace shell. The smell of it was not pleasant, but it was also not unpleasant, and I caught no whiff of foul rot or poisonous tang on the air. It was, as with so much food down here, an earthen smell, of upturned soil beneath old stumps. Like the shellfish crawlers, I let the overgrown woodlouse sit for a long while to ensure most of the moisture was cooked out of it, and to hopefully permit whatever I didn't immediately eat to keep a bit longer as the time in this tangled mire of moisture and fungal decay marched ever onward. When, after hours of being rotated over the well-fed flame, I finally removed the leg segments and tested a chunk from one of the ends, I found it less rubbery than the lake chamber crawlers had been, and devoured every ounce I could stomach. 
I would pause whenever I felt filled to bursting and sit languidly until I felt able to eat once more. Then, warming the thing upon the fire all the while, I would cut into its soft underside again and gorge until I felt on the verge of illness. But hungry as exhaustion and the hopeless hostility of my surroundings had made me, I could not finish the beast over the course of what I thought to be an afternoon, and some more salient part of my mind doused the flame of my animalistic need to eat until I burst. I buried the half-corpse that remained beneath a bank of the sharp gravel which so often hugged the banks of runoff streams and overhangs along the forest chamber walls as a measure of protection, and then bedded down for an early rest on the cool stone, with a sizable pile of the alien fungal fuel nearby to feed the fire should I wake up and find it wanting. I was so ragged by that point that sleep was easy despite the strange environment and uncomfortable position on unforgiving ground, but some time after my near-immediate fall into unconscious oblivion, I cannot be sure exactly how long, but it couldn't have been much more than an hour, there sounded a rustling and stirring in the dense growth down the stony and moss-eaten embankment that separated my camp from the gleaming gauntlet of flora. I woke immediately, gifted the alertness of a wild beast by my days on the move, and looked down into the tangle, my eyes watering with the strain of trying to discern shapes amidst the luminescent jungle. The first thing I registered was movement among the alien scrub. It swayed and bristled with disturbance here and there, and it was evident to my eyes after so long spent watching it for potential assaults during my trips through the jungle chambers that there were things lurking at the forest's edge. There was a clicking and shuffling, as of many pointed legs thumping stone. Flashes of orange and red were seen now and then as vibrant shelled bodies writhed and scuttled in the murk. What these things were, I did not yet know, but I would not have to wonder for long. One emerged at first, tentative and measured in its movements. It was a great, round, terrestrial crab, standing perhaps knee-height on a man, but with a thick and at points serrated armored shell upon its back that stood far taller. Its black eyes watched as I tried to remain absolutely still, and its forelegs plucked and swiped at the stalks, as if cleaning the orbs for a clearer view. The thing's claws, one shriveled and one bloated, stirred beneath it and clacked slowly as it observed. The noise of the jungle about me had died away slightly, I realized then, for barring the echoed thrum of running water, I heard no beasts save the crab thing and his still-hidden fellows in the densest stretches of foliage. Now the others emerged, first making six and then twelve, and before long several dozen sets of beady eyes watched on from the shadows beneath the fungal fronds and gleaming mushroom trees. The light of my near-dead fire pit was between us, and though the chamber was well lit, it seemed something about the open embers troubled or deterred them, but I had no guarantee such a situation would last. After several long moments spent in silent, icy consideration, I rolled slowly onto my back and sat up, my obsidian shard gripped in my hand pathetically, as if that would prove useful. The beasts remained in place, though I saw their twitching grew more agitated and unpredictable than before. Still careful not to move too suddenly or appear active and awake, I carefully slid my left hand up along the ground to where my jacket pack had served as a pillow and swept it up under one arm. With my right, I leaned out to where my half-eaten woodlouse was buried in the gravel and clumsily sank my hand there until I felt the singed shell and could flip it out of its burrow. Still the things watched, some large as the first, others stunted as household cats. Occasionally, one would take a tentative step forward, only to dart back two or three, seeking the security of the ranks behind it. The clacking of claws grew bolder, 
and even more were poking forth from the fungal fronds now, adding their weight to the slipshod formation of crustaceans. I knew what I had to do. The only escape was up the rough-hewn, slick rock of the cliff behind me. Such a climb was not impossible, but the moisture and clingy growth upon the stone would make it more than a bit risky. Moreover, it seemed impossible that the things looking on from the eaves of the forest would prove incapable of skittering spider-like up the wall in my wake. But I could not kill or maim them all, and as I tugged my woodlouse prize, perhaps the thing which had drawn them to my camp in the first place, and fastened my jacket pack about my neck, I struggled to discern how I would ascend with my food in tow. First, my thought was to leave it. Perhaps that was all the things wanted, and they would drag it back into the trees. But the silence of the fungal wood told me these things were not merely scavengers. The jungle would not have fallen into frigid quiet for pickers of bones. These were pack animals of a sort, I knew even if their skittish minds were more insectile than those of coyotes or wolves. Still, I rolled the scarred woodlouse shell downhill towards the things as I backed slowly for the cliff behind, anything to slow or dissuade a pursuit. But the gamble immediately proved fruitless, for two of the smaller creatures greedily dragged the meat into the fungal morass behind them and only a handful of the more alert specimens followed them in to dine. The rest continued their vigil. If anything, their trial runs forward grew more bold, and their twitching grew more eager, their angular bodies backlit eerily by the glowing forest floor they ruled. I had only gotten about five or six feet back from the fire pit when the largest of the beasts charged in earnest and the others followed suit. I was caught then between two choices, neither promising. The first was to immediately flee up the cliff face and trust the things would not catch me low or, failing, follow me up. But this left too much to chance, and even in the split second I had to consider my options, I leaned the other way. The second, more wasteful, and perhaps riskier choice, one I had mulled over since seeing the first of the beasts vomited forth from the fronds was what I chose. I had palmed the powder horn in my jacket pack during my rise and had ensured it was on top of the pile. I slid the horn with a precision that must have been granted me by terror and need alone from its perch over my shoulder and popped off the cap in one fluid motion. I then tossed the full contents of it in a thick cloud towards the fire pit, where embers still simmered, and turned my head away. I didn't watch whatever brief flare of light and crackling fire ensued. I know it badly singed the hand which had gripped the horn and some of my hair, something I realized only later, when the rush of the situation had abated, which suggests the flare of ignition was hot and bright. But dispersed as it was, there was little concussive force, and no shrapnel or thumping blast followed the ignition. Rather, the cloud of powder crackled loud and fierce, making a shrill series of pops and sizzling sparks that still hopped upon the floor when my eyes opened, and I made good my escape up the rough wall. The ignition had taken hold as the first of the crabs neared the pit, and though it is unlikely any were actually harmed, the echoing noise of the cloudburst and the sudden appearance of the flash and smoke that followed had the effect I had gambled for. The beasts were all gone when I looked back over one shoulder, hiding, just out of sight, on the eaves of the woodland. They watched on as I found my first handhold and began the clamber up, slipping and jolting but keeping firm on the sharp edges all the while. I knew even then their retreat was not permanent, and even as I crested the first ridge and came to a steep incline that proved less treacherous than the sheer drop of before, I saw that they were testing the open ground again, as if to see whether another blast would follow. But, obviously, no more were forthcoming. 
I crested the next incline and then came to a tiered sort of natural staircase and began to hoist myself up from titan step to titan step, each small rise along the wall feeling more like delay than victory. I had done this almost five times by the moment the largest crab thing hit the wall, its fellows in close pursuit. I crested the final step and leapt for another ledge down the way, almost sliding off with the force of the landing as I came back to ground. A look down told me the small ones could navigate the cliffs better than the big ones, but still, all were making progress. I climbed up another sheer wall of blessedly broken and asymmetrical rock, straining nails and bloodying palms in the process. Every scaled tree or climbed wall recalled from childhood had done little to prepare me for this, and my shoulders and back and arms ached with the strain of an already exhausted frame pushed to the very limits of exertion. All the while, the clacking grew closer. No calls came up from the hunters, and no coordination, at least that I could perceive, was undertaken. Some fell, with the largest of their number toppling from the steps I had ascended, and seeming to lull injured or stunned at the cliff bottom. But the swarm was not deterred, and continued its tidal rise up the cavern wall, with a single-minded determination to eat. I came into a thick band of the mist that hung in the middle heights of the jungle chamber, and for a time I was blind to any stone more than a few feet before me, and had to lunge and grope in the haze for holds. The rocks were wet, and my hands had grown numb and stiff, as if frozen in the silhouette of hooks. Now and then I kicked smaller and nimbler crabs which came forth from the fog to nip at my boots back down the incline, and heard them clatter as they struck stone on the long way down. I emerged, gasping and nearing the edge of absolute devastation, to look out over a cloudscape of roiling mist and moisture which thrummed with the wings of flocking insects and swooping bats amidst spires of fungal flesh whose caps glowed like suns overhead. The roof of great columns and inverted spires of stone was hundreds of feet up still, and in those scant seconds I was absorbed by the sheer stupid brilliance of my newfound surroundings. I glimpsed distant falls on far walls, and rainbows wrought by the wet atmosphere of the vast room. It was actually raining across the way, miles distant, the confined space having developed its own weather. But here too were the shadows of giants astride the windless air, for from the stalactite forest which rained on the ceiling, certain somethings with a wingspan of twenty or thirty feet occasionally swooped from the shadow to snatch giant dragonflies and return to their unseen perches. I hung shocked in place for a few scant seconds, and then, kicking at another pursuer which welled up from the mist behind me, was forced by the close pursuit to move on. But I was losing ground, as I'm certain I had been all along. Especially now, with the failure of my battered body looming large, I could not push much longer. So it was that when I hoisted myself up onto what I thought was a ledge to find I'd crawled into a great, deep, horizontal crack in the side of the jungle chamber, and saw a space to stand and move in the fissure, I took my chance and settled in to do what I could to defend myself. I drew my pathetic obsidian shard once more, and backed slowly away from the edge of the fissure into the gloom that reigned within. When the first of the crabs crested the edge, though, they were snatched from the stone by the same winged giants that I had glimpsed harrying the dragonflies. They were vast bats, fox-headed and cunning, which sung to one another on the hunt. There was a strange linguistic element to their chatter, something almost akin to alien languages among Indians or foreigners, nuanced and lilting and rapid. Perhaps they had been coming for me, and my retreat into the gloom of the crevice had spared me their attentions. But I counted my blessings regardless, as I still count them, 
for the winged giants broke the momentum of the crustacean charge, and I saw no more crest the ledge after the first ranks were taken. I almost sat down and caught my ragged breath. The pursuit had bludgeoned my willpower more totally than any struggle I'd yet seen, and part of me wanted to collapse into sulking rest. But I was in the dark again, and even as I felt the relief of escape, I reminded myself nowhere was safe in this underworld until I ensured it to be so. Thus, I stood taller and squinted into the shadow about me, looking this way and that down the length of the vast fissure in which I stood. The floor was near perfect, as was the ceiling. Whatever geological conspiracy had brought about this gap in the wall had made it clean, and had torn from one end of the jungle cavern to the other like a knife through wet clay. It was more than a mile across, but the gap itself was no taller from floor to roof than ten or twelve feet at most, narrowing off near the distant edges. It reached deep into the stone, seeming to descend slightly as it went from where I stood near the brink, and there was light far away as the fissure seemingly broke into another chamber beyond a hundred yards off at most. But the most alarming feature of the crevice stole any relief I might have felt at seeing an exit, for hazy obstructions blocked the light here and there. At first I took these to be foliage, but as I tentatively pressed a few feet in to attempt a better look at the distant light beyond, I saw that they were webs, much like the ones I had glimpsed in earlier chambers. They spanned the brief height of the fissure, and strands of them formed columns and haphazard bands like spittle in an open mouth. Dead dragonflies and softly glittering darters from the air of the broader jungle cavern hung still and stayed within them, and a strange, alchemical smell hung about the air, not hazy or poisoned as with the riverside gorge, and not quite rotten but rather conjuring to mind the musky and desiccated innards of abandoned homes, old tomes, and ancient bones. I saw no spiders to accompany the webs, whether on floor or ceiling, but much as part of me wished to light my sole remaining and half-burnt candle in an attempt to see creeping doom in the dark, I thought better of it. I saw no hunter nearby, and given the sheer scale of the crevice, I might hope to pass through unseen and undetected, so long as I didn't stumble headfirst into a web and die like some ignominious insect. I fought back my fear and exhaustion, stayed my trembling hands as I adjusted my pack, and gripped tight my obsidian as I pushed towards the soft, cold light visible through the open mouth of the fissure. Praying with each step, that I did not have to use it to cut myself desperately free. The gentle reflection of shiny silk was the saving grace of my shadowy walk. If one was careful and strained their eyes long enough over each span of open stone, little hints of glints in the dark would betray lone strands or wires in the gloom. Though I doubt even now single threads could hold or bind a grown man, they might alert still lurkers hidden from sight to a trespasser's presence. Each inch I crept forward was haunted by memories of a large golden garden spider, which had kept its intricate web near my parents' woodpile one summer when I was small, and the speed with which it had darted to see to new arrivals made my blood run cold as the image was transcribed onto the situation at hand. My paranoid care was enough, though, despite my worry. I emerged from the other end without glimpsing a lurking crawler in the fissure. My lone picture of the eight-legged beasts, which dwelt therein, came just as I reached the far edge, as I caught motion far off to my side on the wall of the newfound cavern. There, a great spider hauled itself back up from some browse or hunt below to take shelter on high. It was a black and shiny thing, fat like a tarantula, but with sleek armor free of hair. But the details were lost on me, 
and it passed into the shadow of another portion of the fissure, nearly a mile distant. I thanked heaven for my safe passage, but simultaneously never let my senses dull to what was behind me as I drank in my new surroundings. I stood far up on the wall of the chamber, perhaps eighty feet from the ground. The new cavern I overlooked was another like the lake chamber into which I had fallen at the start of my escape, but this had the near-unbelievable scale of the jungle chambers about it, and the stone shores of it boasted small outcrops of gleaming moss and cold-colored fungal forest, which chilled me with thoughts of the toxic air and awful slugs of the low crag in which I had almost met my sleepy end. The depths were more alive than ever with the glint of aquatic flora and fauna, and the waters were so vast that they lapped and bobbed like the surface of a calm sea, perhaps disturbed by vents and currents from below. It was far brighter than the first lake chamber, and far dimmer than the jungle had been, but this was welcome, for my eyes had begun to ache with the sheer agonizing gleam of the prior rooms, and like a man going snow-blind, I had begun to yearn for darker climbs once more. I picked my way down to even ground at the water's level relatively easily, for the walls were less steep and cliff-like here, and once I could stand without worry over slick moss or clinging web, I sat down near the shore and drank deep, careful to watch for motion in the water as I did so and granting the pale fungal copses scattered along the shore a wide berth. I had worried the water might be salty. So gigantic and so deep was the pool that I must on some level have associated it with the sea and worried that it might be undrinkable. But such things are apparently rare underground, and it was as clear and fresh as the first pools had been. Indeed, based upon what I would later learn, it is wholly possible the two are connected, for great sunken tunnels and channels of teeming and deadly underground water link many of these vast lakes in the region. In the moment, though, I just enjoyed the drink and felt my heart rate at last descend into a normal and steady rhythm. But relief gave way to nagging worry. I was out in the open on the shore and there were no obvious breaks along the distant shoreline that indicated ruins or outposts on the edge of the cavern. The far sides of the lake were obscured by distance, mist, and occasionally monstrous natural columns of rough stone, which rose from the depths to hold aloft the ceiling. With no way of knowing what hunted along the shore, and with memories of the browsing spider I had seen returning to the crevice fresh in my memory, I resolved to walk the unforgiving beach and see what I could see before I relented to the sleep my body cried out for. I turned right, a decision made more because the nearby land seemed less ragged than because of any set goal I had, and began to trace the shore, winding outward towards the wall to steer clear of any pale mushroom groves when they drew too near. Guano and the mud of rotten life collected in slick piles along the low crooks in the floor, and the lobster things thrived here. I stomped too as I went, and bundled them into my pack, relieved I would not go long without food. Though I kept my eyes skyward, thinking of the vast bats of the jungle chamber behind me, I saw only more regular specimens break the glittering panoply of quartz clouds above and the terrible wasps and bloodsuckers and gnats of the prior caverns seemed gracefully absent. The still air was stirred by no distant waterfall, and with the noise of the jungle chamber strangled by distance, I was immersed in a quiet which allowed me to hear my own footsteps, and perhaps better order my own tired thoughts, for the first time in days. I reflected upon the savage chance which had brought me there to that sunless lakeshore, and as a mile slipped past without sign of danger, my thoughts came to truly rest at home for the first time since making my leap. I wondered how long had passed since I had left the light of the overworld, and wished to know what was going on along the boring streets of Richmond I had left so gladly behind me. 
The childish warmth of home seemed less terrible and suffocating now, when I was confined miles and miles below ground, with seemingly endless expanses of hostile ground all about me. But this eventually became an exercise in exhaustion, and as the second and third mile came and went, more primitive parts of my mind must have drowned it out as my steps came slower and wistful sorrow overcame me. Soon my concerns were again purely animal, and it is only now in reflection that I can summon up those distant thoughts of a lost and far-off home. A coiled millipede many dozens of feet long frightened me as it rose up to observe my passing from a cluster of fungal fronds up the wall, but otherwise the walk was uneventful. The water off to my side was alive with flickers of light and submerged motion, and fish teemed even in the shallows of the pool, but none troubled or startled me, and I tried my best not to look off into the deeper reaches, lest I see disturbing things there. But the fourth mile saw me glimpse a sort of cube of polished stone further along the shore, and as the fourth ended and the fifth began, I made out that it was studded with several window apertures unmistakably like those of the buildings I had witnessed in prior settlements of the stone giants. This was a hut or shack by comparison, perhaps twenty feet to a side, dwarfed by the large interconnected compounds of prior outposts and standing isolated and alone. Yet, much as it bucked tradition, the simple reliefs and symbols along its flanks left no doubt as to its construction. Reflecting now, it floors me that I approached so casually. I can lean on the excuse that I was ragged and exhausted, but even in that state, the omnipresent threat of danger down in these caverns should have granted me more sense than I had. But the dwelling was dark as any I'd seen before, and as I drew near, I saw no movement or stirring which spoke to life within, whether it be by twisted humanoids or some other denizen of the cavern. I approached without worry, and though I stayed quiet as I ever was, I did not trouble to remain unseen. There was an old and battered thing beached along the gravel of the shore that I correctly took to be an aged, hollowed-out carapace of some mighty insect intended for use as a canoe. I rounded the small, single-floor dwelling and saw no entrances save one, a shallow round door facing the lake that seemed built for visitors to crawl through, but which was not sloped or slick as so many others in the city chambers had been. The barren interior glimpsed through this door was of angular seats and low tables and unadorned sleeping cubbies of flat stone, carved into the natural floor with unparalleled grace. Its walls, save for the viewing ports which allowed the low light of the rest of the chamber to slip in, were unadorned, and its whole space was empty. I looked along the shore the way I had come, and saw nothing. I looked along the shore further along my way, and was met with the same vacancy. My eyes heavy and my limbs leaden, I ducked into the building I took to be derelict, ensured it was empty of any lurking beasts or telltale droppings, and then bedded down in the sleeping cubby that occupied the back corner. With my prior sleep having been interrupted, and the ensuing escape having proven so harrowing, I did not linger in thoughtful wakefulness more than a moment before slipping into sleep. But when eventually I woke... I would come to curse my slothful carelessness. Six. Metropolis. I awoke to barely audible scuffling upon the stone. I began to stir, uncertain where I was for a moment, jerked violently from vivid dreams or nightmares 
reminiscent of the pursuits I had endured down here in the dark. But fast as I was to waken, I was not so swift to rise or struggle, and I had been pinned to the ground and throttled into silence before I could so much as shout in anger or alarm. I have had years to think back to that scant string of seconds in the dark. Even without knowledge of what was to come, I understood I had been a fool, that I had squandered my freedom, such as it was, after just a little over a week in the tunnels. And yet I had been so battered by those days that I doubt now I would have made my second week had I continued to stagger on alone. Some beast or ailment or noxious bit of fauna would have cut me down long before I bumbled my way back into a span of caverns that could take me back to the surface. This certainty of a demise I did not meet has often left me sitting up in my chamber at night, wondering whether it would have been a better fate to have died free, as I so boldly claimed to my mother at the start of my journey west. But all these considerations formed and fought their battles over sleepless nights which came later, when the gravity of what had happened had fully sunken in. When I awoke and was fast gripped by the same breed of spindly, iron-strong hands which had spirited me away into the morass of this chittering hell in the first place, I had little time to feel anything more than hopeless defeat and tired fury. I was not spirited away this time, at least not immediately. I counted four of the tall, pale men in the room with me, two pinning me down and another pair watching on from the entrance, where they stood with amber eyes glinting wide and vivid in the half-light of the shadowed stone hut. They remained still for some time, hands close to spears and axes and clubs of strange make as they observed, clicking and whistling and chattering among themselves like birds or bats or bugs, in a tongue no sane man could decipher. I imagine now they were debating what to do with me. Though I know none of what was said even now, I think it probable I came within a few coarse words of death that day, for the things know nothing of mercy towards us and I had apparently trespassed against them. As I would come to find out much later, the building in which I had bedded down for my desperate rest was a sort of watcher's station, an outpost of a city still further west meant to house huntsmen and rangers of a sort, who kept a watchful eye upon the religious traders of the east. I would see that city before long. And yet, I might easily have died there had their debates gone differently. I might have been unceremoniously clubbed, or broken at the spine and left to die, or worse, devoured. These specimens of the things spoke no language of men, red or white, and never tried to attempt their own interrogation. They just debated among themselves until they had decided on a course of action, and then went about their business, settling in to light a tiny fire in a central depression in the floor and eating the crawlers I had killed as rations in front of me the moment they had finished plucking through my belongings. I sat leaned in the far corner nearest the sleeping cubby I had occupied as they did this and chittered amongst themselves. It was a surreal few hours, for they let me be, quite correctly trusting that I knew an attempt at escape was futile, and paid me no mind as they rested. They had been on some sort of patrol or rounds, I supposed, but I did not speak to ask questions I knew would be spoken in vain. I did not move nor draw attention to myself. I merely lurked and waited, half relieved, I must confess, to not have to worry about what my next move was. Such terrible freedom of choice in so terrible an environment had been stolen from me, and in that first drugged moment back in the clutches of inhuman captors, I felt giddy and light, almost as if I had been rescued. Though the room was dark, I was able to study the things more closely. They were a couple feet taller than I, with sinewy bodies they kept mostly bare to better tolerate the humid warmth of the caverns, and ivory skin which was not nearly so delicate and prone to bruise or abrasion as ours. Their gigantic eyes, like those of most night beasts, 
caught the slightest of light and threw it back as if they were cast in metal, and bulged from the skulls in a manner that made them seem almost always on the verge of wrath or agitation. Black veins were painfully evident in the skin, and like certain specimens of cave fish, whenever one moved across the fungus and moss light spilling in through the doorway, the backlighting would reveal the bones and organs within them shifting as they went about their business. Their noses were upturned, and so slight they might as well have been a bare skull's nostrils. Though I at first took the giants to be earless, flat ovals on the sides of the skull proved to be great pads ringed by the vestigial leftovers of ears, which vibrated and trembled at the slightest of sounds. Their heads could swivel like an owl's, and at any distant clack or clatter or splash which rolled in from outside, often unperceived by me, the giants would reflexively snap their attention in unison towards the window or exit nearest the noise as if on reflex before shaking off the alert and returning to their meal. Their jaws could distend far more readily than our own, and their gleaming front teeth were all sharp, though I would later come to think this was due to ritual sharpening and, in later life, the insertion of metal replacements for the fangs. This made their eating a thing of horror, for their jaws sheared and shattered chitin like it was cracker or biscuit, and their necks distended far more ably than any man's. They seemed to prefer to swallow the flesh they ripped loose in fist-sized chunks, which fought snake-like down into their near-translucent torsos. All their motion, from finger to toe, was so brisk and fluid that it proved almost hard to perceive. Their eyes darted about the room just as swiftly as their tones and whistled vocalizations darted up and down in pitch. They were so hard to trace and reconcile with men as I had always known them that I thought of them, as indeed I still do, as monsters. And yet, there was some twisted kindred or interrelation there, even if that relation was more akin to that of the angel with the demon than of one breed of dog with another. This deep kindred almost made the strangeness of the giants worse, and in all my years amongst them, I have never been able to view them without a shudder of revulsion. But, though they took their sweet time, their stolen meal did not last forever. Their conversation turned slightly agitated, and at length I realized they were delegating who would leave and who would stay, with one pair remaining and perhaps continuing whatever patrols or vigils they were bound to, and the others bearing me away along with them. When the quartet finally split, I was shoved out onto the boat of Chitin that adorned the gravel shore, and the pair minding me took up positions before and behind me in the craft, after shoving it off into the shallows and snatching oars made of bound claws atop dried and stiffened chitinous limbs to propel us along that awful, clear, calm water. There was much less grabbing and carrying than there had been during my first abduction, and as we drew off from the banks, I watched the two lingerers as they continued off down the shoreline about their business, spears in hand. Even more so than before, I could not launch a true escape now, not with the teeming hordes of alien life swimming beneath me and the eyes of my minders to either side promising that I would be snatched if I so much as flinched for the water. They had stripped my improvised pack of everything, from candle to scattered tinder to the obsidian knife, and though they had not stopped me from retrieving the empty and unfurled jacket upon our departure, that worn garment alongside the clothing I had slept in, was all I had to my name. And so, I watched and listened and soaked in the environment and my captors' interactions with it, beginning a helpless but dedicated career of silent observation and plotting which, I hope, will soon be put to full use. I had known from the shore the water was more lively than it had been in the first lake chamber, but once we had slipped a mile or so from that shore, and the many-colored lake bottom seemed leagues away down through the crystalline water, I could see that life in all its dreadful glory. 
Fish either glowed and strobed in the water above the fungal shelves and reefs which gleamed beneath them on the distant floor, or else boasted mirror-like scales that played havoc with an observer's eye as the surreal color palette of the lake flitted off them in reflection. Some beings were so clear of flesh that they were almost invisible to the naked eye until they undertook motion, and their meals thrashed visibly about in silhouette within them once swallowed. Still others seemed little more than shadows against the gleam of the lake floor, great serpents and other, less recognizable forms slipping to and fro in the deeps. The lake bottom itself was not flat or without contour, for it was just as ragged with hills and cliffs and overhangs as any subterranean landscape I'd seen in my travels. The luminescent fungal things which grew there seemed prone to clusters like coral on a traditional seafloor, and these in turn hosted the thickest throngs of life. Devilfish large as whales would appear seemingly from nothing, as their camouflaged flesh flared into life on the attack, snatch up prey in their mighty arms, and then withdraw into impossibly tiny crevices and caves with graceful ease their bodies deflating about them as they went. Our early hours on the water eventually brought us to a huge natural tunnel that wound off into relative darkness along the cave wall, the glowing life of the water seemingly tentative to reside within. My minders, seeming to hesitate on the cusp of entry, fidgeted with one of several large bundles they'd carried out with us, a live but sluggish full-grown specimen of the giant woodlice I saw as they unbound it from its strange and mossy shroud. We then paddled silently forward into the dark, my captors both keeping close watch on the walls and water about them as they navigated. Minutes in, after rounding several corners and coming into a space lit by an eerie, fiery light from below, we drifted out over a chute beneath the water which opened onto a broader chamber under the half-flooded tunnel we occupied. The floor of the chamber was strange, a sort of water's surface beneath the water, perhaps oil or some sediment that hung like a cloud at the bottom. There were groves of distinctive, mushroom-shaped things growing down there below the surface, and the light they cast gave me vision again though my captors seemed to strain their eyes looking directly at them. Still they looked, for as we hung there motionless above the gap, and I began to silently question why we were waiting rather than moving on, I saw that they had been anticipating something. A huge entity came sluggishly into view from somewhere on the eaves of the orange-lit chamber beneath us, and rose up to occupy the water beside our dwarfed chitin canoe, remaining just under the surface. I can only describe it as a golem or a patchwork of living and animate roots and moss and weed, with a silhouette not unlike a snail's or slug's. But it had no shell and no normal eyes, just several glowing orbs the consistency of jellyfish that sunk in and out of the fluid foliage that made up what might have been its head. Beneath those orbs it seemed to cast up towards us, there hung a curtain of tendrils or tentacles that looked floral and flitted about like feelers in the water. Many asymmetrical limbs, not jointed but limber and flexible as a squid's, flexed slowly upward, looking for all the world like the branches of a tree, as if, I thought for a brief moment, it was waiting for something with arms outstretched. The captor that manned the front of the boat dropped the woodlouse he carried down to the thing, which almost tenderly pulled it under the water and into the embrace of root-like limbs and hanging fronds of moss flesh. It then sulked back into the soft orange glow of its aquatic mushroom or moss grove, and my minders took us swiftly along the way. Though we soon emerged into another massive, almost oceanic lake chamber, my mind was still on the plant thing, and the exchange we had carried out with it. Though I would see many beasts on our multi-day voyage over the water of the lake system, from pufferfish that shamed cattle to water striders large as giraffes browsing the shallows, 
None intrigued me quite like the guardian in the tunnel. As we moved from chamber to chamber and passed more and more such intersections, guardian is precisely the term I began to ascribe to the plant things amongst their gardens of glowing flora. Some were lone hermits like the first, and others dwelt in clusters of two or three, and had to be fed accordingly. We would stop over at huts similar to the carven one in which I'd been captured and rest now and then, and one of my minders would often use this time to capture more wood lice for the tolls we had to pay. My sleep in these situations was never good, for the stone giants did not linger more than perhaps four hours in slumber, and I spent as much time twitchily watching for opportunities to bolt as actually resting. But the tall men were not unobservant, and slept or hunted only in shifts, so that one pair of glassy amber eyes was always upon me. Almost always, these huts were empty, making me wonder how unfortunate I had been to be stumbled upon by the group which captured me. But dwelling too long on how I might have reacted differently to that first hut and beached Chitin canoe did not help me escape, and merely served to heap worry and shame on my shoulders as we pushed from day to day over what I had come to think of as a great interconnected freshwater sea. But soon the shores grew busy, Compound villages like the first I had seen crept into view now and then, but these glowed with the light of well-tended fungal gardens and moss murals that brought lively and shifting color to reliefs in the walls, and bustled with folk of the underworld as they went about their business. We kept our distance, but my captors often talked with stone giant fisher folk who were out on their own craft, and occasionally spared large grouper-like fish for use as rations or offerings to the tunnel guardians. I suppose my minders felt it would be less distressful and disruptive not to bring me ashore, as the fisherfolk looked on me with the same level of disgust I must have shown them. After entering these more populated chambers, we only stopped once to rest inside our boat at the end of a long pier of jutting stone. We ate small portions of raw fish as rations, and I had to sneak drinks when we were on the move, as my captors did not seem to think it necessary to feed or water me any more than they themselves required. At length, perhaps five days after my recapture, we came into yet another flooded tunnel, but this was different. Its walls were shaped in smooth and decorated stone, painted in the fluorescent ichor of mosses and fungal life just like so many of the wall murals in the lakeside villages had been. It was wide as the causeway tunnels back in the ruins had been, and the traffic was thick there, with a second hand-shaped canal parallel to our own allowing egress in the opposite direction. Scant minutes brought us to a gatehouse of some sort of woven metal, left to stand open as stone giant guardsmen bedecked in shining armor of thickened insect hide, and waving spears at all newcomers, determined who was and was not permitted to pass beyond. My presence caused quite a stir among the other travelers in the canal, and the guardsmen at the gatehouse were no different. They at first chittered in their vile tongue to my captors, seeming on the verge of conflict, but this soon abated, and whatever retorts my minders offered up had led some superior of the other guardsmen, whose whole head was encased in a spined helm which brought to mind the heads of horned beetles, to sweep down steps from whatever garrison they occupied off the canal and give us passage after waving off his subordinates. When we emerged from the tunnel canal a hundred yards up and came into the city chamber beyond, I was immediately overcome by the sight. I spent the entirety of the hours which followed weaving through the city by boat in a sort of stupefied haze. I could not know it then, but what I observed would soon become my prison. And what a prison it was. The place was giant, even by comparison to the main city chamber I had witnessed in the eastern ruins. Perhaps the light accentuated this size, for this urban hive was as well lit as the jungle chambers had been 
and the walls and streets and waterways and gardens were alive with the song of bugs and the glow of mushroom or moss. Tiers of interconnected compounds rose in ranks up the flat and hand-worked walls, and from the misty air overhead yet more dangled like carven mountains from clouds, some forming columns that connected to dwellings on the floor and others hanging free like great unnatural stalactites. I seemed surrounded on all sides by the teeming architecture of the cave folk, and their chatter and bustle, and the alien nature of their cries in open squares and across public bridges made me feel like I had stumbled into the core of an ant colony. Wherever I looked, it seemed saucer eyes stared back at me from window and balcony and canal-side wall. Some, especially those I took to be lower tradesmen or riffraff around the waterways, were near nude, just like my minders. But many more were clothed in weird silken and form-fitting garb that jutted out from the body in places like the edges of shells or the joints of chitin, mimicking the wilderland that surrounded their bastion of blood-drenched culture. Great gastropod things with carts affixed to their shells pulled loads of goods and twisted folk down the streets behind them as beasts of burden, and guardsmen like those at the gatehouse rode about upon cricket-like steeds, painfully similar to the lurker from the ruins, often leaping from rooftop to rooftop or scaling sheer walls as the need arose. The ramps and covered walkways and chute entrances of buildings sported pedestrian travelers who scuttled on splayed limbs like monkeys and clung to sharp inclines as easy as might a spider. All these and more looked down at me like I was a pilfering mouse they'd spotted upon the floor of a house. Some, especially the young, seemed more taken and followed our vessel along as it went shouting what I assumed to be questions to my minders which were never answered. Many others looked, but the fascination was passing, and they went back about their business after the brief displeasure of the initial sighting had faded. I would later learn I was far from the first surface dweller to arrive, and most of these had likely seen someone of my kind before. The canals that crisscrossed the city chamber terminated in an inland lake at the center of a manicured garden commons of pale mushroom trees and lawns of close-grown moss, surrounding towering stone statues depicting warlords or heroes of the cave folk with weapons aloft. The lake itself was square like a fountain, and the carven walls of it beneath the water were as decorated as any other wall in the town but the floor of it was replete with the same orange copses of mushroom growth as had been the lairs of the tunnel guardians we had passed on our trip. Amidst these wandered, slow and seemingly aimless, many of the plant golem guardians, though these seemed uninterested in what was going on overhead and ignored us as we pulled up to a stone dock and disembarked to finish the rest of the trip on foot. They guided me up a slick ramp from the commons and onto the upper tiers of this span of the city, and before long had dragged me up a broad chute into a towering building whose interior was divided into many small chambers like the cells of a beehive. In one of these, we found a stone giant dressed in the finery of his people milling over an archive of stone tablets upon which the things kept their indecipherable scrawls. The room was lit with cyan and violet mushrooms and planters that cast the whole interior in strange hues and shadows. My minders announced themselves, and the archivist seemed almost annoyed to see me, the sort of passing irritation one would give a common irritant, rather than the overt disgust displayed by the rest of the populace. The three chattered amongst themselves for some time, and eventually my minders unceremoniously departed. It was the last time I saw them. It is my understanding based on what I would later learn that they were compensated somehow for my delivery, but given that the things have no currency, this compensation was likely in the form of relief from a certain span of duty on the frontier, or access to women, relations with which the stone giants manage closely. 
the archivist began to speak to me. At first, I thought he did so in his own language. So used was I to not being able to comprehend my captors. But upon the third agitated repetition, I realized he spoke to me in English, though it was so garbled by his strange vocal organs and the accent of whistling and popping diversions that punctuated the speech that it took a great deal of focus to decipher. He asked where I had come from. I answered, though I'm sure the information did not clear much up for him. What he meant, I was to learn, was where I had come into the caves. But even then, when I told him I had been taken down into the caves in the Kentucky Territory, this seemed to mean little to him. In time, I communicated that I had been abducted, escaped, and then recaptured, and tried to describe as best I could, with copious repetition throughout, what sort of chambers I had passed through on the arduous journey that had led me here. When he learned I had been through a section of ruined city, he diverted the interview for a time and began to ask whether I had heard voices during my time there. Not knowing how I should answer, I told him about the whispers in the desecrated temple, but then honestly reported I had heard no more. This seemed to pacify him, and we continued with the details of the trip. It turned out I had by way of the cavern layout and luck more than any plan, been moving westward all along. But the archivist, who might be better described as a sort of administrator, knew of no raiding parties from his city who had been dispatched so far east, and assumed one of the lesser cities, as he put it, in their alliance was responsible for my initial capture. He then asked what I had done as trade, and what sort of caste or standing I had had in former life, and recorded each detail on a fresh slab of stone. I noted as he did this that he was not writing in clay. Rather, he smeared what seemed to me to be solid stone in a pungent alchemical mixture of some sort, which he kept in a chitin flask of strange design. This seemed to render the surface malleable, allowing him to then etch characters into it with the long, dried leg of some insect as a sort of carver's pen. The strange interview ended abruptly, and before I could register how strange an experience it was, the archivist had summoned several guards and handed them the slab he had worked up for me, issuing them extra instruction in their own tongue. He then went back into his cell, and the guardsmen guided me back out of the building and up the next ramp to the highest tier in that sector of the city. Here the most palatial and well-decorated structures stood, and it was into one of these that the guards dragged me. My new home, as it turned out, the estate of the extended clan of one of the concubines to the king of this city-state. It was interconnected to all of the other royal compounds on this tier, and was heavily patrolled by the guardsmen. I was to reside in the cellar levels of the structure, and was soon introduced to my new master. Shatash is the best representation I can give of his name. He is an elderly specimen of the stone giants, and was apparently quite well-traveled as a soldier in his youth. He is fluent in many languages, but can only speak to me via a Cherokee man called Sequoia, who he also keeps as a slave, that transfers what I tell him in English to Shatash in Cherokee. He serves as something akin to a cartographer and lorekeeper for the harem tier, and advises the king on troop movements in times of war. My life has for years been lived in the light of mushroom and moss in rooms I cannot escape through the slick shoot passageways of the stone giants. There are six of us down here, in the mapmaker's quarters, all surface men from different places, coordinating to inform Master Shatash of what the giants can expect to find in different regions of the overworld, and record these territories upon great maps of stone that Shatash and his artisans maintain for the crown of the city. We seldom leave, and when we do, we are generally utilized as party displays on the commons, to give the public something to gawk at. 
Occasionally, this entails being fed to giant mantises that royals keep as pets. But other times, it simply involves milling around or singing songs in our own languages. The stone giants seem to be eusocial and interact with one another with an intuition and intimacy which seems roach or rodent-like. They rest in shifts across the city, and their calendar is measured in rest periods rather than any metric of sun or moon, something which only works because they slumber with the regularity of bugs. They grow alert or experience mirth or indulge in wrath only in unison, it seems, and can easily be stirred to rapturous cheer or murderous rage when gathered in swarms. Not long ago, I saw a Frenchman named Noah, who we knew in passing was kept as a sort of pet in the neighboring compound by the tall men there, drowned in the lake at the city center when he failed to perform some trick his keeper wanted of him. His master had grown irate and beaten him, and though most in the crowd knew her not, they joined in with her, and maimed him so badly that when he was thrown into the lake, he could not keep himself aloft, and died in the still water there. Much to the amusement of the crowds attending the idolatrous religious festival being held, who shifted from wrath to mirth as easily as a breeze shifts direction. Upon his death, I recall seeing the strange guardians in the water come up to bear him away to the bottom. I am not worried I will suffer such a fate. Shatash is a hopeless recluse and seems removed from the herd moods of his people if only because he is so seldom among them. But I only see the comparative light of the open city once or twice a year, and as the months tick by and I imagine season after season slipping past without having an ability to measure or experience them, I miss even the deadly chaos of the open cavern systems I navigated in my first days underground. I know it would be better to die out there than in here now. Far better to be eaten by a primordial predator than kept as a token by some devil in silk, grown fat and roach-like in the safety of his godless underground city. Two of my companions in the mapmaker's quarters are too old and have languished too long here to want to leave, or are tormented by memories of things they saw in the outer tunnels too greatly to risk them. But Sequoia is only a bit older than I, and there is a wild streak in him that hates to be hemmed in as much as I do. He, along with myself and two other younger men, are devoted to the idea of finding freedom or being killed in the attempt. Sequoia has conspired to use some of the stone-shaping alchemical mixture we use in the making of maps to craft crude knives and spears of solid but brittle stone and we have tunneled all the way out of the compound with our reserves of the stuff. Our master is ill and frail with age, and we have hidden our tunnel behind his casks of the odious blood wine the giants enjoy. The exit opens up into a sheltered wall of the canal overhung by a bridge, for which I have shaped a replacement tile, which we can swing open and shut like a door. Given the stilted and all-consuming nature of the stone giant's hive existence, there are times when the canals and streets of the city are all but abandoned, and are minded only by the guardsmen who remain awake through the not-quite night. Sequoia and I have successfully navigated out of the canals and into the maze of alleys before. We've narrowed down a replicable path of escape using the maps available to us, which should take us right to a canal exit where we will attempt to kill the two guards that mined the smallest of the city's gatehouses and commandeer a craft to take us out into the lake system. Beyond, the four of us will navigate by way of maps we have commandeered and roughly copied in ink onto more manageable cloth, if indeed such fungus-based material can be called such, stolen from other wings of the harem tier. It is this material onto which I have copied this account, for I am the only man of letters among our number, and we have a limited supply of the pilfered material to work with. I, as I have said, intend to carry this account, and leave it in the upper chambers if it appears at any point we are going to be overtaken. I do not, therefore, know who will read it. 
Literacy in surface languages seems foreign entirely to the cave things, and besides those captured by their raiding parties, I do not know what sort of madman from the surface would ever find himself stranded down here. I hope, of course, that I will emerge unmolested and uncaptured with my companions into the light of the sun on the plains, and eventually find my way eastward towards home. That, in time, this account might serve as a brief reminder of all I overcame in my years of torture beneath the stone. But, should this prove a false hope, and should you stumble upon this account, I will endeavor to hide for you the maps we were to use for our journey in hopes you can find the sun yourself in time. If you have these things in your possession, but you are overtaken by the tall men, the stone giants, the below folk, then do not surrender to them. Make them kill you. Struggle for your freedom until you can struggle no more. If anyone save me escapes with this account in hand, I would like word of my death sent to the gunsmith Costigan or his descendants residing in Richmond. Good fortune to us, or to you. Irvin Costigan <laughs>